Well, is it encoding? Yeah, it looks like it's encoding. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Open Source Tonight. I'm Vincent, and in just a moment, we're going to try out this live streaming part of live. I'm just going to bring down my levels here a little. Okay, hopefully we won't clip at all. Not even once. Are we going to clip once? We better not. Okay, <laughs> hopefully not anyway. So let's see. Are we connected? Well, I thought we... <sighs> okay. Maybe not. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I think we're having some issues. I don't know, but for whatever the reason, the stream isn't. Okay, folks, I'm sorry about the issues. The encoder's bitrate was way messed up, and it was trying to stream literally faster than my upload speed, like, to it at stream. So I apologize about that. Um about the the glitchiness hopefully that will be the last of it youtube seems to be happy now so i think we've i think we've got it um so but anyway everybody give me just a moment to get set up we're going to be trying out uh kde plasma here and fingers crossed that it's going to just work good um so you know we're about to to find out i guess and yeah, I guess we'll, we'll go from there, okay? So folks, that's that's what we're gonna do. Why is the, oh no, what's it doing? It, uh, for some reason, the virtual machine doesn't want to load either. My apologies, folks, it's, uh, Seems like it's technical to do that. Let's see here. So I'm restarting the VM software. Now it's running. Okay. Good. <clears throat> That's good. So let's try this out. So uh, everybody just bear with me for just a second. I'm getting it situated. But yeah, we've got KDE Plasma that we're going to be trying out. So if I actually switch to that, probably should look at you. You guys and everybody on the screen here. So, if we do that, you can see right now. I might actually want to turn my levels up just a tad. Give me. Okay, hold on. Well, hold on. Let me just go to the board and do it. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. There we are. Okay, I think, yeah, that should sound hopefully good. We'll find out. Is it? Does it sound good? Yeah, okay, the, the, va the waveforms look good. And I've got some compressing on. We may want to... Bring up our makeup game just a tad. I want you to hear me loud and clear. My apologies about the issues, but I think we're good with those now. Let me see if the chat is busy yet. Chat is not busy. I'm hoping that uh, you all will be chatty. I don't know what it is. Some live streams I get a lot of viewers, some I don't. Um, it's interesting how that works. But we're ready to get started. So let's go ahead and do that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you my 
computer. That's what I'm going to do. And uh, we'll go from there. So let me get started. I actually should start recording real quick too. That way we can have a local recording just in case we need it. <clears throat> Okay, folks. All right, now we're ready. So let me go ahead and All right, so we are recording now too. So that's good. All right. So folks, what I'm here to talk about today everybody that's watching the live stream and the potential recorded version I cut down the bloopers out of just so everybody knows today I'm gonna to be talking about KDE plasma and testing it out the title I'm sure explains that but let's get right on into that right now so here we go this is KDE plasma so if I try and log in let's find out what happens right now All right, and as you can see, we're, we're just waiting on it here. So, there we go. Now it looks like it is cooperating. Let's see here, okay. And I would like to Switch back to here. Okay, hold on just a second, folks. Let me just fix this real quick. Where is. Oh, I clicked the wrong key. I was about to say that didn't make a lot of sense. All right, so right about. We could probably bring the, the size of this box down a tiny bit. And then let's just, yeah, let's just say I'm over here in the corner. Okay, now we are ready here. So this is KDE Plasma, and uh, let's check it out. <clears throat> All right, so let's see here. What is there that we can look at? So we've got system settings. Let's take a look in there and let's see what we can find, right? Let's see what we can find. So we've got our system settings and we can look at the different style. Let's put a dark theme on. I think that would look nice. I have played with KDE Full Disclosure a little bit in the past. It's just been not that long, actually. I played it maybe a month ago or something like that, just a little bit and the dark theme didn't seem to oh I bet it's over here that I want to actually there we go now that should take effect well and I think it's broke oh no actually maybe it's not Okay. So yeah, now I think it's cooperating. Yep, it's cooperating. So this is our our dark theme. So if I open up, let's say a file browser, yeah, doesn't that just look more snazzy? I like a dark theme. So let's look around 
uh, Discover. That's their software. So let's look at that. This isn't a VM with limited graphics. So don't expect a good graphics performance on this. Just so everybody's aware, you shouldn't be judging it based on that where it's in a VM, but uh, still interesting to play with. Let's see. So this is applications that are already installed. Oh no, these top two are, but then this one isn't. Okay. So if I was to install, let's say I install this. How's the process look? Okay, so it asks for the password. I'm going to type it in and hit OK. There seems to be a lot of glitches with the uh, screen cap. Why is it doing that? Let me see if I make the VM smaller. Does that help? No, I'm not so sure. Hmm. Anyway, I'm trying to install Cool Retro Term. And. Okay, I think that that might have stabilized a little bit. Weird how full screen makes it have issues. I'm testing some stuff out here. When you, when you watch live, you get all the bugs. Um, so, but anyway, we've got a terminal here. If I full screen this, will it cooperate? Hopefully. But anyway, we've got a terminal here. Yeah, I think it's cooperating. But we got a terminal here, and this is literally like simulating a CRT. I'm pretty sure I've seen this before. So let's do HTOP, for example. HTOP is not a command. All right, let's do top. Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, like, I guess, let me guess, the screen cap is broke again. Okay, I guess we won't, sorry, folks, I'm trying not to be frustrated here, but it's getting kind of annoying that, uh, that I'm having to do it this way. So, uh, hold on a second, let me check this out here real quick. So, okay, I think that's stabilized. And hopefully, this won't be much of a problem now. So, okay. Uh, for those watching live, I am keeping the chat open so we can take a look at what's going on but let's go back to the computer now and hopefully we can get it to cooperate so but uh, I'm just not going to full screen it like actually here we'll close Spotify too all right but anyway so yeah this is the terminal emulator if it cooperates yeah there we go now it's cooperating and it simulates like an old terminal I just installed so that's what it is and I installed that with the software store if I exit, what does it do? Does it shut down an interesting way? No. But yeah, so if we uninstall that, okay, it asks for my password. So yeah, I mean, this is the software installer app in KDE, and I got to say, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Um, interesting. Okay. So let's see what else we can do. If we go back to like system settings here, what do we get? What do we get? Let's see. So we're getting, let's see, display configuration, window management. The window management in KDE seems to be very advanced. I mean, like these window rules here at the, in the corner, yeah. over here, like this, this stuff is very advanced, right? So I find that kind of interesting that, that we have that. And that kind of interesting that we have that. So I mean, you could do. What if we add new? Does it give me controls? Yeah, like I can actually. Let's say. Uh, okay, let's just say this is probably not right. Firefox, and then normal window. Add properties. What's properties can we add? So we can like set. Is this matching on full screen or something? I guess it is. I gotta I tell you, folks, I'm not really an expert on the window management of KDE, but I just I will say I do find this interesting. Okay. So what can we do? We look at system information. 
yeah I'm gonna discard those changes so I am running this on Debian 11 okay and yeah everything seems right interesting and man the graphics on this it this is the kind of thing that needs a lot of acceleration so I can change my cursor around it looks like yeah and that's honestly that default cursor I don't care for it folks I I just I just don't care for the default cursor in KDE, you know? Um, I'm not saying there's anything in particular wrong with it. I just don't like it, you know? It's just it's just one of these things that I just don't care for. So let's see what else we can do. So we, we looked at Discover. So, I mean, like, it seems like a pretty... Good desktop. What's information center? Is this part of KDE? Or I assume it is because I haven't seen this. Yeah, okay. That literally brings up what we already had. Okay, so that's good. Wonder just... Okay, so the... Oh! Okay. This, this RAM usage screen is actually pretty nice. So that's interesting. That's interesting. I gotta say, like... I thought that the GNOME system manager tool was pretty good. What is it? The system monitor. I thought it was pretty good. But this is um, this is pretty impressive right here is this, this system manager tool. Uh, it's pretty impressive actually. Like I said, it's pretty impressive. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see. What so we can do about KDE, and what does that do? My screen share, by the way, is a little bit delayed here, or it's over the network. But KDE is a world-class community of software engineers, artists, writers, translators, and creators who are committed to free software development. KDE Plasma produces the Plasma desktop, hundreds of applications, and the main software libraries that support them. Interesting. So there you go. That gives you report bugs you can join KDE you can do all these things here that gives you some information about it so I mean it's interesting is this like so there's a handbook option up here what is the handbook so this is like the KDE help center and it seems like a quite nice application actually I do notice that my mouse cursor isn't always going back to the a way to one that I set a few minutes ago. Graphics information, credits and license, Unix man pages. Interesting. So, hmm. Increased font size. Is like, oh, okay. Oh, so if I do this over and over, just, okay, but how would I, I guess it would be under view, set encoding, interesting, so I, there's got to be a way, yeah, configure fonts probably, yeah, I don't think this is what I thought it was, maybe, oh, here it is, it's, it's because the window wasn't fully maximized, so decrease fonts, and there we go and yeah I mean it's it's honestly not too bad KDE isn't hmm interesting so I can right click on the desktop and what can I do I can create a bunch of documents I can create a link to an application to a folder to a directory to a URL I wonder if you create an HTML file, does it have anything in there? Test.html. Okay, and then let's go open this with Kate so we can look at the source it's created. It's probably in oh! It's not interesting! They actually give you a basic template. Okay, that's actually pretty cool. Hmm. I wonder why that they're not doing what is it, like the 
the dog tag up here stuff, the HTML tag. I guess they don't fill in the language. You would think stuff like this they would fill in based on the user's language, but I, I suppose that they'd rather the user fill it out. But that's actually pretty cool that it. Uh oh. I opened it. It looks like their web browser, but I haven't looked at this in a long time, their web browser, so. Huh. It seems it's pretty interesting. Let's say we go to Google. Google.com. Okay. I mean, it loads, but I feel kind of slow. Huh. Copyright 2016. Do they not make this anymore or something? Or did they just forget to change the copyright date on it? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And if you click on the icon, interesting. So you could do special window settings. Oh, okay. I see what this is. This is that um, window setting stuff we were talking about with KDE. You can actually click on that. I didn't know you could do that from within a window. Cool. That is pretty cool, I got to say. All right, let's get rid of this file because it's just annoying me sitting on the desktop a little bit. So what else can we do? Let's see. We've got utilities. Let's look at some of the utilities. So we've got KCALC. Let's see what that looks like. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it seems like a decent enough application. Can I not resize it? I don't. Yeah, I don't think I can. All right. So that's kind of annoying. Um. Interesting. But yeah, I mean, it should work just for fun. Why not? Twelve plus twelve should be twenty-four. It is okay. And again, the screen share is a bit delayed, so. Next time I probably will run an HDMI cable from my Mac if we're going to do this setup on the couch again. Hmm. Okay, fine. I want to look at that. Let's see. So to me, that's a really important part of it. Oh, this is fancy. This is fancy. So I can search for star. And oh, there we go. So it gives me include subfolders. Uh, interesting. So what if we don't include subfolders, but we say show hidden files? What does that give me? Okay, that actually works. So let's say I wanted to look at my bash RC file. There it is. All right, that's actually pretty cool that we can that we can do that. And properties, contents. Wow, this is actually pretty advanced. Hmm. All right, I got to say that is that's an advanced way to find a file. Let me check the chat here. I thought I seen something come in. Hey Vincent, I'm using KDMI on my desktop under Debbie. Interesting. So what do you think about that, Ravi? <laughs> do you like it? Um, how long have you been testing it out? I'm curious about that. I, I did I did notice I've watched one of your videos the other day and I did see KDE in the background. So I was thinking, hmm, okay. Interesting. So yeah. I, I take it I'm guessing you probably like it. Um, I know several people that use KDE. I think it seems to be like the really power user desktop. It's also very Windows-like, so I suppose that's, uh, at least in its default configuration, it feels very Windows-like to me. So I suppose that could be good for people that like that. Uh, let's see here. So what else can we try out? That's a good question. So one of these... Well, probably all of these are KDE, I would think. So, here, let's open up GIMP because that's a GTK app, and I want to see how that the GTK app renders. Okay. Seems to work pretty good. Okay. Can I theme it to be like, okay, just, yep, that will do it. So, but now it's not a dark theme, but uh, hey, at least it's a light theme. So I suppose if you wanted to, you could do that. 
Okay. And it looks like that Robbie has replied. I do like it. It has some pros and cons to the Mint laptop I use. Okay. Very well. <clears throat> Very well. Okay. Good to know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it's actually pretty good. Interesting. So we've got the clipboard app down here. Can I edit the clip? Yes, I can. Interesting. Okay. I got to say, I mean, there's some interesting features here I could see myself using, like that clipboard stuff. I use the clipboard all the time, and I really like um, to have a lot of control over it and be able to just make it work good for me. So that might actually right there be a, a good reason for me to use it. See, look at notifications here. So we can do no disturb. Interesting. So if I do one hour, it actually tells me at 2.11 it will go off of do not disturb. So I suppose that could be good if you know you're going to be in a meeting for, say, an hour. You could do not disturb it. And then, so this is the actual settings. Hmm. It seems pretty powerful. So I can come in here and it looks like configure a per application thing I yeah, configure events interesting okay I guess this is like a standard system thing in KDE I gotta say that is interesting we got KDE connect which I, I've heard a lot of good things about okay let's see for those who don't know KDE connect will allow you to talk to a smartphone I don't know if you can do it on iOS I'm pretty sure you can on Android though um, and so I suppose that could be kind of interesting. So this is like a calendar. And let's say I wanted to add an event. Yeah, I mean, it does seem to, there it goes. And again, the screen shares a bit delayed, but there it is. It's a personal calendar, title, location. So let's say I add one, test show. And let's see, what if we put the location in as home? And hit apply and okay. And there it is. Ooh, and can I, I can drag it, okay. That's actually pretty interesting. I don't think that the built-in gnome one can do that. K okay, organize is what it's called. And it's copyright date is 2019, so interesting. I don't know if Debian is shipping that or if that that's just the way it is. Hmm. Interesting. So. K mail. I've never used this. Let's look at that. What does K mail look like? Okay. It seems pretty good, and it opens up with a wizard. And okay, looks like they're using Chromium. Uh, what's it called? The Chromium framework here because this bar on the side here looks like that. So that's interesting. Probably says something about it in about. It seems like they always list their libraries. Huh, they didn't actually list that. But yeah, anyway, it does seem to be interesting. That's actually pretty cool. They list the libraries though. I kind of like that. So we get delayed messages. Oh, cool. You can you can really like customize this thing from the looks of it. All right. Let's go to address book. What if we open that? So it integrates with like a system address book and you can Interesting. Hmm. Free slash busy. I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Street, okay. Very well. Very interesting. So it sounds to me like that we've actually got a, a pretty interesting thing. I will say one thing I like is this desktop background. It's nice. Show K runner. Oh! Hold on. It, it, I think that's it. So if I search for something, I'm assuming this is like, yeah, I can get it to start something. 
Interesting. That is interesting. Okay. And I think the screen share broke because Firefox... There it goes. It's... Yeah. Yeah, I think next time we're not doing this over the network because this is not remotely good enough. But anyway, yeah, it's opened up. Interesting. So I suppose that could be really good. And it looked like there was a command shortcut. Yeah, Alt Space. Interesting. So you could use that to open it up more easily. Okay. So, folks, I got to tell you, um, I'm not really sure what to check out on this. It seems interesting. Yeah, uh, but I'm not sure. Okay, so Robbie is saying here, it shows the program bouncing like a basketball when it loads. And, yeah, I, I did notice that. Um, I don't really know if I like that, though, to be honest. I guess it's an interesting animation, and, I mean, uh, to a certain extent, stuff like that I think is up to subjective taste, right? You know, some people might like it, some people might not. I don't particularly care for it, but at the same time, it's not really a big deal that it's there. Um, that being said, I mean, it is good, I think, to have some kind of an animation so the user knows, okay, I clicked on Firefox's icon, and you're actually working on opening it. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> so that's that's an important, an important distinction. Okay, let me just check the... Streaming status here. Make sure we're stable, and we are okay. Good. So that's that's what we want to see. I use mine to uh, with Caden Live. Robbie says for video editing. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, that's one thing I think that would make a lot of sense is having KDE probably makes a lot of sense for having K uh, Katie and Live or Caden Live, however you want to pronounce that, because it's very heavy. It, it uses the KDE framework and QT, and so I think that would make a lot of sense to probably use it there. Um, and because it's KDE, I would assume it themes probably really well. So that is something that's something to think about. But yeah, I'm not really sure what else I can test with KDE or what y'all would like me to see. So if you have any suggestions, put them in the chat and I'd be happy to try it. Well, I guess one thing we could do is look at network stuff here. I do see there's like a a network kind of viewing thing. So let's look at that. So this pulls up the networking stuff. And we've got network. So does it scan? It's just empty. Hmm. This is the actual open screen. So SMB, I've got some SMB shares. Does those load? Let's see. So this is in the KDE default file manager, from what I understand. Uh, Dolphin. And it's trying. Loading folders. Um, this may be because it's in a VM. I know that with some things, networking-wise, VMs can be a little strange. So that might not really be a bug or anything. Interesting. Okay. What about add a network folder? I'm guessing this gives you, yeah, a wizard, right? Yep. Looks like it's a wizard. And again, of course, there's a delay. But yeah, the wizard, so that's interesting. we got web dev in the wizard, FTP, Microsoft Windows Network Drive, Secure Shell. Hmm. We tried the Windows one. So this would be like to manually connect to a system. And then you could create an icon for the desktop. Okay. I, as someone that has network shares that I occasionally get into, that could be interesting to play with. <clears throat> has anybody in the chat actually played with network shares in Dolphin before? Uh, maybe you, Robbie, have you dealt with that? That would be interesting to see if you have. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems interesting to me, KDE does, but I don't know. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so Robbie says, I use an app for the HD home run, but it will not strip after I install it. Uh, HD home run GUI config. Okay. There have been a few programs that have done that. 
Uh, there's been a few programs that have done what exactly, though? I'm not clear on what you were referring to there. My apologies on that. We could look and see if the, the HD Home Run software, if I could install, I don't have an HD Home Run to connect to, but we could test it out anyway. So let's see here. HD Home Run. Um. Yeah, we may have to, it's probably a proprietary app, I'm guessing. So let's try launching. Oh, we'll just use Conquer to look. Why not? But yeah, um, you know, HD Home Run, and it literally gives me a 1980s uh, Z80 or Z80 system emulator, which is interesting. Okay, and then this is not cooperating. Why is it not cooperating? I don't know. That's interesting that it did that. Um, yeah, seems to work now. That's just strange. So HD Home Run GUI Linux. Okay. Well, let's see here. So, now oh, it's actually open source. They do have source available. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, but they, they looks like they do expect you to build it, I think. It looks like it. Uh, so, yeah, this is the firmware. But, yeah, it looks like they do expect you to build it. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of software that expects you to build it. I mean, I could do that. Uh, it can be installed from S Synaptic Package Manager. Oh, okay. Well, let's do that then. Robbie to the rescue here. Oh, I bet that package manager isn't installed yet. Okay. Yeah, I think I might have spelled synaptic wrong. Yeah, I did. There it is. So yeah, it's not installed. So if we install it real quick. And for those that don't know, uh, watching at home, this program is pretty advanced as far as packagers go. A lot of people really like it in the Linux community. I never really have had like much interest in it, to be honest. It's all right. I've used it. Um, but yeah, I usually just install everything straight from the command line with apt, uh, cause that's mostly what I'm running is Debian systems. And I just do, you know, sudo apt install Firefox or whatever. And you know, that's that, but let's open it up. Okay. It's going to ask for my password. All right. And it looks like it's open. So let's see here search HD home run so we're gonna search there it is all right good so I should be able to mark for install yep and then apply okay there we go Changes applied. All right. So, let's try running it. HD, run HD. Nope. Interesting. Um, so, why is it not... Maybe multimedia is where it would be, but you were saying it doesn't show up. So, generally the way that most desktops work, and as far as I'm aware, KDE works this way as well on Linux, is you put a .desktop file in slash USR slash applications, 
I think it's, yeah, or slash, USR slash share slash application is what it is, I believe. And if you don't have that, uh, <laughs> you know, then that's a, a thing. I had to look it up on my computer for the spelling, like many spellings in Linux programs. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you know, Linux programs, they seem to have this tendency to be, like, unique spellings and such sometimes. So that's a that's a thing you get. Um So I'm guessing I have to run this from a terminal. Let's try it. So I have to search Okay. Well, Oh, it's, it's K-Console, that's right. I know a little bit about the system. Well. Well. I'm either spelling it wrong or it's not installed. Probably utilities. I mean, surely they have the console installed, right? Okay, you know what? Maybe they don't. I find that strange they wouldn't have the console installed, but they might not. So, let's just go and try and find a terminal. Okay. X term. There we go. Let's check. Let's see if they've got X term here in the repos. I'm sure they probably would. We'll just use that. Oh, X term's already installed. Okay. So maybe that's what they're shipping in Debian. There it is. Yep, it's already installed. All right. So HD home run. There it is. Yeah. And. So it's um, config. Is there? There's a GUI. Yeah, there's a GUI according to the GUI. Interesting. So like the GUI didn't seem to install. Maybe I installed the wrong package or something. But yeah, basically in a nutshell, if that desktop file is not present, from what I understand, that would be a problem. I did try the terminal, but it would not load. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, at least for me, I was able to get the command line version working, as you just seen. But it looks like there's a GUI version, too. And, it, you know, GTK2 is getting along in the tooth. And so I'm wondering if maybe it's an issue with GTK2. But they have a package for it. I'm assuming that's an official Debian package. Hmm. Got me scratching my head on, on what's going on with that. Um, interesting. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's... Uh, Pretty obviously it's a concern. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um. But yeah, I'm not really sure what would cause that. I'll put a link in the chat real quick for everybody here to the free desktop spec. Bear with me here for a minute. Um, because if you put a dot desktop file in there for if you can figure out the directory, Robbie. That would be good. And I mean, you know, if anybody else needs this too, you can always use that. So, but uh, as a developer, it comes in handy to know this. But it's something that can be used by others too. Where is the. I'm trying to find. Okay, I think this is. Is this it? Okay. So, trying to find, um, okay, yeah, this is pretty technical. So I will actually put in a link, uh, two links. I'll put in one to the ArchWiki. Okay, I'll put one into the ArchWiki. And then I will also...
I will also put that in the chat. Oh, and uh, do I have, uh, do you have this set up so I can voice chat in with Discord? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose we could actually set it up if you want. We could try it. I, I got to be honest, I haven't actually tested this, but with the setup, as far as I can tell, it should work. Might as well try it. I'm testing out some new stuff. So, yeah. But here, this is a link to the desktop icons. But yeah, we can try it. Uh, no harm in giving it an attempt. So yeah, if you want to... Let's see. Give me just a second and I will... I'll join on my laptop and then I'll get you on the air. Hey, Robbie. Let's see if I can hear you. So everybody, this is Robbie that I'm supposed to be meeting with here. I don't know if there's an audio glitch or not. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Uh, thanks for asking. I got to be honest, a little bit earlier, I was a little frustrated trying to, with some technical issues like with broadcast stuff. I actually tried to do this show last night too and I had some issues and I just got tired of fighting with it. But today it seems like it's going a lot better. So I'm um, streaming with a hardware encoder. I used to do software encoding, what was a hardware encoder on my NVIDIA card. But now my switcher that I'm using now is actually got a hardware encoder in it. And so that's what I'm streaming to YouTube with. And I think that will help with a lot of glitches that we've been uh, dealing with. Ah, uh, and um, Little King of the Kill. Interesting username, I suppose. Uh, love your channel, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate the support. You know, the channel's been doing, I'll, I'll take a second to address this, really good. Uh, just a little bit here lately. And it's, oh, I think we have Robbie's audio. Uh, hello? Yeah, 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 I'm on now. Oh, you didn't hear me before? No, but I'm hearing you now. <laughs> You're on the air, so I, just I so you know. I your audio on, on the live stream because uh, it was dubbing back. Like, uh, always on Discord, it's instant, but on a, a YouTube live stream, it's usually like 20 seconds behind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that, that's something that it does. This is, uh, if you want to see my setup, Robbie, this is, this is what it looks like over there. You can see that is... My uh, my oh, yeah, production switcher video. There on your phone, yeah. Yeah. Well, so you know that's that that's what I'm doing. I've got a monitor here for those that don't know, showing multi view of my switcher, and then I've got my camera and everything set up. But anyway, yeah. So let me see if I can get you switched over on the air. I actually I thought about asking you to join the show anyway <laughs> uh, the other day when I was going to do a live stream. So I guess you read my mind. Now I've got your video. Let me see here. So we're going to try this out for everybody watching at home. I don't make any promises this is going to work because I haven't tested this yet. But there's nothing like testing in production, right, Robbie? Oh yeah, it's great. All good. And Discord, it's uh. Actually, I want to get. I wanted to actually just set up my system because I've been using Restream, but I just want to use. I think I just want to use Discord for connecting my calls now. Because uh, um, I'm finding I'm paying a certain amount of money for a restream to do live streams, but I don't find this I'm getting really the value that I'm paying for it out of it. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, I mean it, it's hard to argue uh, with that. You know, for me, I don't really see the point in restream because if I want to stream to multiple places, you can set up on a Raspberry Pi an Nginx web server that will do RTMP, for example, right? And then yeah, restream. You, so. you need to do a tutorial on that, and uh, I think that would be very valuable. For I, me. I've actually been thinking about that, so that's yeah. that's good. I have to call you out and I'd be like, "Hey, I was thinking about doing it anyway." And then Robbie said, "Yes." It, it, will, it will save people the the money that they are spending on Streamyard and restream and all that. If they, yeah. If you, if, you, if you just had that. Yeah, That'd exactly. Be great. I think it would be. I think it would be a great idea. Where is? Sorry, everybody. I'm trying to find a cable here to get Robbie on the air on my switcher um but yeah no i think it would be a good idea to have that and i mean it's it's not really that hard you do have to edit a config file and on like ubuntu for example or raspberry pi os the package just you just install 
uh, the the Nginx package, and then you just edit the config file, restart the server, and then you can stream to it. The only real complaint I have about it is it has no security, so I would not port forward that if you say you wanted to uh, yeah. put it on the internet. But if you, you know, I've got relatively fast internet now where I could do two or three streams out of the same place. So you could send to that server from, say, OBS or hardware encoder that supports RTP, whatever, right? It doesn't really care yeah. what it is. And then it will restream it out to two or three places. So, and it works. I actually did some testing on it uh, the other day. It works great on a Raspberry Pi to do two streams. At, at full HD 30 frames. So, yeah. you know, like a Raspberry Pi 4, if you can get one, <laughs> keyword if, oh, it's not that four, expensive. Yeah, I think I have a 3, and I'm playing video games on it. <laughs> there you go. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a Pi, obviously. That's just kind of my go-to low-cost computer to, you know, throw Linux yeah, on. Exactly. Somebody did ask, the little, kill, little king of the kill asked me, uh, have I tried StreamYard? And the answer to that is, I, and I don't know if he's asking that to me or to you, but I did try StreamYard, but uh, I found it had a few things that Restream didn't have, but I didn't really, I didn't love either of them, really. I just liked the Restream because I could, I, I, I do live streams and I put it on multiple platforms like uh, Facebook and YouTube and all that, but it doesn't let you do some of the other platforms like uh uh, if you stream to Odyssey or a place like that, I, I haven't found Odyssey, Rumble, or anything, anything like that, that you can just, you know, stream to all these other uh, offshoot places, um, or maybe TikTok, or whatever. I don't even use TikTok, I don't like TikTok, um, but uh, all these other uh, video platforms that are out there, just to have, like, um, to um, diversify your audience. Like, what I, what I do use Restream with, I can get... Uh, I can stream to Twitter. Not a whole lot of people watch on Twitter, and Twitch, and all these other uh, live streaming platforms as well. Like, there's a ton of them now. I got you. And I think YouTube is probably, I, I from when I when I talk to people, what's happening is YouTube. People are getting tired of YouTube because, especially now, it's like November and it's Black Friday. You know, it's like shopping season, and uh, even non monetized channels have ads on them now. Yeah, you know, I I don't particularly like that. I think that. I, I think that if they're going to run ads, then we need to get a cut, the, the, even if we should, have they, 10 viewers. People should be getting paid, yeah. They should be getting, like, they should just bring back the um, everyone's monetized if they're going to monetize on their channels, yeah. Yeah, I, I think they should. And, I mean, you know, part of the reason that I have been uh, working on building my own streaming infrastructure, uh, live.vincentmagger.com, by the way. The domain exists, uh, it's set up, but I haven't got the stream set up on it. But eventually, I'm going to be streaming to YouTube and to my own system at the same time because I've got the technical know how to set that up and it's like, hey, you don't want to watch the ads? I'll, I'll take your viewership, right? Without the the ads, right? Or at least without ads, I don't get paid for. I might throw in an ad there when if I get a big enough audience. Hey, this live stream is sponsored by Insert Company here. You should, you know what, from watching your channel, you really should have monetization and more views, that's for sure. And yeah, I, and, and there's other Linux channels that are like really focused on Linux stuff um, that are really big channels, like. Oh yeah. And they have big audiences that uh, are on other platforms too, like on Odyssey, like uh, Switch to Linux. He's on on multiple platforms, and he has a pretty big audience even on like you know uh, on um, Odyssey and other places like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually set up an Odyssey thing, but I I didn't particularly care for. I don't know. The platform just seemed to have. When I first got on, it was early, so it might be better now. But there was technical issues that I found, and you yeah, know, there was just a lot of like I don't know. It's like YouTube was twenty you know, I don't know, back in two thousand six or whatever. I, I mean, it's kind it's, of long it's the wild it's west. Hard. I think they're not a billion dollar company behind it. So uh, yeah, I mean, in Rumble. I'm. Uh, what I, what annoys me about Rumble is. Um, Rumble doesn't have like uh, notifications like how YouTube does. If you, someone comments on a video, you get a notification right away. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see that in Rumble. Odyssey has that, but I don't think I have the engagement on Odyssey like how I do on YouTube or on Facebook or some of these large uh, platforms. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the engagement is a, an important factor, yeah, well, I think. And... Most people like you, most people will be on um, uh, the, the big, uh, the big tech sites. It's just the way it is right now. I mean, um, and, and, and those people could be just because the reason why they're doing that is they're using, they're viewing on a phone or on a smart TV, which is a large part of audiences. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an obvious issue is that, um, you know, obviously there's definitely people doing that. 
Uh, let's see Hi. here. So I think I've got it set up where I can get you. Yeah, yeah, a little king on the kill. Uh, yeah, they are. Yeah, they, they announced that quite a while ago that they were going to start uh, monetizing on um, non-monetized channels. Uh, and I don't know, maybe that's YouTube's way of making uh, like um, to pay for their bandwidth because of that ad and that ad revenue. Uh, well, I guess they are making good money because like a lot of the um, big channels, they're making decent. You know, like basically they're like. Um, it's like a, a, a lot of people are quitting their full-time jobs. Yeah. And doing that, but but another thing I've heard too is that a lot of people are using TikTok now, so YouTube is not as big as what it once was because there's all these other platforms now. So with these other platforms popping up, um, a lot of people are not using YouTube as much as what they may have once uh, had even like a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think YouTube is definitely probably lost some viewership and stuff like that. And then again, for the more technical people, uh, you know, they can set up their own stuff relatively easy. So it doesn't help that, you know, to, to them that, you know, somebody like me could build something. Now, I will say this, the bandwidth costs can get pretty high pretty quick, which is one of the reasons that, full disclosure, I will be running ads if I can get any advertisers. <laughs> You know? Oh yeah. Well, you know, it's like doing anything. You need to make even within Linux, like for Linux channels to monetize. I mean, I, I really feel that they should because it should, they should. There's a value to what they do. It's like the tech support that they are, right? Like a lot of, uh, um, uh, it should be a way of monetizing. Even like for this, um, I don't know, um, for, because I, I think a big part of what Linux needs is the tech support in the community. There's, there's going to be people that will volunteer to do it, but. Uh, it's also, um, and, I, and I do tip, typically have, have volunteer a lot of time to uh, help people um, uh, with what I can in Linux, but um, a lot of the time too with Linux, it's just, you just got to simply Google it and you'll find how to do a quick fix. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, the nice thing about Linux is, you know, there is a lot of information out there, but I do, I do think that, I mean, I'm biased obviously as a Linux YouTuber, but uh, filmmaker, whatever you want to call it, that I would want that to be the case. Also, I'm going to try and switch you over here so that people can see you on the air. So just give me a second here. Okay. Can you still hear me? Okay. Let me... Right, let me turn my audio on so you can hear me. Uh-oh. Maybe not. Are you there? Uh, well, okay, folks, just a moment while I, let's see. I don't know if I should keep, there keep talking go. there. Now I can hear you. So Okay, you can hear me now. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. Let me untangle my headphones. Right there. <clears throat> just Stop. a second. But, uh, yeah, so I can get back to where I need to be. Unfortunately, I can't get you a return video feed. I was going to try and do that, but I can't find the cable for it. And I'm like, well, let's, you know, let's not have people not being able to see. So let me switch over to you. So everybody, this is the legend. Well, I'm looking at the legendary, but this is Robbie. <laughs> he might be legendary. Are, are you legendary? Uh, your audio cut there. Copied. Send an invite link to a friend. Oh, wait, I want to edit that link because it's going to expire in seven days. I just make them whatever. It, forever. All right, so I don't know if you can hear me. I lost your audio. I am just, I'm still on Discord. Yeah, I'm still on Discord here with my webcam. I just want to post this over in the uh, in the YouTube uh, YouTube link here. If uh, you want to join the Discord, here's the uh, Discord link. Uh, this server is for the Linux Guru Meditation. It's just a group of us from uh, my channel. I guess a lot of my friends that are um, Enthusiastic about uh, Linux, you can uh, check that out there. Um, so yeah, it's just one of my. It's about yeah. Just a, I think there's a lot of Linux servers, but what I, what I like about this one, it's a smaller one, uh, so it's not like so overwhelmingly large. But there's a few people in here where we can connect with and talk about Linux. So uh, I th I think can I still have your audio there, Vincent? Or are you uh, maybe Vincent's? Yeah, now, now I got Unless my. Vincent's gone off somewhere. I, I've I'll got my. Uh, here. I, I've got the sound uh, back. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, so we were, we were talking about restream and um, and how to um, 
um, the features of Restream and, and StreamYard. What I do like about Street Restream and Re StreamYard is there's a few things like for production uh, things. Like, I think you could do, and I think I know how to do that all in OBS now. But it'd be nice to be able to. Uh, yeah, he's fixing his audio there. Yeah, can you hear me? And uh, Robbie, can you hear me? Um, but uh, and that's another thing is I like using OBS. Uh, I'd rather just be um, running everything in OBS and not. Uh, um, like if you want to run a, a green screen, uh, for example, you can do stuff like that. Um, I, I guess you can with StreamYard and OBS too. There's the uh, yeah, we're looking at the um, the Linux Guru Meditation Group. If, I guess anyone else wants to call in here, <laughs> you can uh, webcam in uh, over here on Discord. I, I, are you there? Discord is awesome. I love Discord. It's like. Um, uh, it's where the social media should go to, where we have like, uh, um, uh, kind of like, it feels like what the internet used to be like when it was a lot, a lot more free and fun. Um, there's people over here in Discord. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, I saw you post the message, but I don't see it here on Discord, unless that was somewhere else. Drop a link. Someone's asking for a link here. Lil King of the Kill is asking for a link for. Uh... Getting the red truck. Yeah. And now I. Oh, I can hear my daughter in the background. <laughs> there. Are you playing? Are you playing? My, my, my mic was not live. Now you can hear. Okay, yeah. Sorry. This is the fun part about being live, everybody. You make about 100 mistakes and you can't edit them out. Uh, so now you ought to be able to hear us again because I was feeding Robbie through the same mic. But um, do you know if they could hear you, Robbie, when they, I had you on the computer, the other one? Yeah, I could hear myself when you had me up talking there. Okay. Well, I assume that if you could hear, then everybody else. So I'm going to switch you back to that. And everybody, I'll be back in a minute. Uh, so here's the legendary Robbie Everso. <laughs> I'm Robbie Strike, sorry, not Everso. All right, as, as Vincent goes and gets some food for his uh... neighbor. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I can share my screen here. Yeah, if you don't have Discord, uh, download it. Go to the Discord. I don't know what they are. Discord. Uh, probably a lot of people would have Discord, but... Uh, Discord.gg is that what their site is? I just I just go in what I what I have here on my on my browser for Discord. 
uh, even if you just do a, dis, uh, a Google search for uh, Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D, um, you'll you'll find Discord, and, you, and and they do have apps that will run in Linux. Uh, I think even in the repository, you can install Discord. Uh, sign up for an account with them. Whoop, did I just change servers? I think I'm still in the Linux Guru Meditation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still in here. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely uh, I'd recommend uh, getting Discord. Uh, I know a lot of people use Telegram. <laughs> and I have Telegram as well, but not as many people. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I know. I know more people on Discord myself, so yeah. Uh, and I have the floor, and I the, he gave me the floor, and I really need to go to the washroom break. So, uh, yeah. So I, we have a Raspberry Pi here, and I'm using it for gaming. I got like some. Uh, I'm making use of these, uh, playing some old school games on it. And I, 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 I don't know. I just never found that uh, I liked using my Raspberry Pi two. I think it was. Must be the two that I have. Um, I've had it for quite a few, actually, a few years now. And, and but I mean, it's fun to play around with. You can put multiple operating systems in, uh, multiple operating systems on a, on a Raspberry Pi. You just put them on one of those. Yeah, right, one of them right here. One of these um, micro SD cards. So you just like just on one of these. Although I have it in the the, the old school bigger micro SD card thingy, uh, so that you can um, pr basically it's like. Uh, if if you ever um, played video games like Atari, uh, like Sega Genesis or whatever, you know you change cartridges. That's kind of what the Raspberry Pi feels like to me. Like you can um, have operating systems and install it on an SD card and then change it around to um, um, whatever OS you want. Because you can use uh, Ubuntu Mate on it, or you can use uh, Co uh, K Word. I'm gonna use the K Word because uh, I got in trouble with YouTube a while back. For talking about legit stuff with the K word, <laughs> and it was legit stuff too. I'm not promoting any piracy. I don't I never promote piracy or anything like that. But um, yeah, so, sorry, Vince. I don't want his channel to get in trouble either. Even, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. So Raspberry Pis are great little inexpensive computers to play around with. If if uh, probably people in this audience they know what they are, they play around with them. And there's a lot of uses you can find for them. And so, uh, yeah, so here I am live on the internet. Yeah, I'm also on Facebook if you want to find me up, up, up there. I'm, uh, or, or over on my YouTube channel. <laughs> you can find me over at RobbieStrike.org. Is, uh, or, .org, dot com. Dot com, RobbieStrike.com. Uh, my... My free to air satellite forum group is freesatellitetv.net. If uh, I don't know if a lot of people use the .net websites anymore, you can hear my kids talking in the background playing this uh, playing uh, Roblox. I don't know if I say it right. Uh, hey, how's it going, uh, uh, little king on the kill? When they pull shady stuff like Apple out and you pay for content and then it disappears they wonder why piracy happens uh yeah um i i, I don't use apple products uh I've, I've been using open source linux stuff for for years i love to try to convert apple users to the linux side uh it seems to be a hard thing though too like they they just take it like they get the financial abusement <laughs> and you just keep taking it like uh like an abused girlfriend like you know uh, goes back to an abusive boyfriend for more like why you know leave them <laughs> Uh, yeah, and congratulations on the 500 subs on Open Source Tonight. Shared your channel a few of my friends in uh, my little community. Uh, great to hear that. For, uh, yeah, I hope this channel, Open Source Tonight, gets um, more viewers. Uh, I, I, I definitely enjoyed a lot of content that Vincent's put together. Uh, I ho hopefully he can put a content for streaming uh, on how he does a lot of the stuff that he does for like just being able to do restream for free, you know, because like, Linux users should know how to use that. And uh, and uh, other software he's been working on. I don't know if he if he's uh, if you guys can donate to Vincent's uh, channel or not. If he has like a Patreon or something like that, up. I'll look here over here on this page. 
Um, but if you do, if he does, uh, send him a few bucks uh, for for what he does there. Uh, you know, I'll pay for some uh, some uh, 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 gyp rock on, on on his walls. You know. I you just going to the oh, it's going slow on my computer here. I see my mug up there on his uh, on his page. Podcast, you got a podcast too, Vince. I didn't even realize there was a uh, Google Play podcast here. Yeah, I'm just looking at the open source tonight thing. I think I want to move this computer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move this. Uh, Oh yeah, I might mess it up. Uh, well, that's okay. I can just walk, stand close to it. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit noisy here, and, it, and I, probably Vincent and I don't care. But it's like a lot of people complain on YouTube. Like a lot of people complain on my videos with my kids because my kids talk in the background, and I'm like, uh, so I'm just gonna take this computer downstairs. Just walking it downstairs. Hopefully I don't fall and break my leg. That would be great on a live on a live stream, eh? <laughs> this is right where I was walking and my leg dis my knee dislocated on me and I was like, ah, that was like kinda painful. And looked weird too. <laughs> oh yeah, you can see my lovely uh video projector. I don't know if you can see that. I'm not really previewing my video here. Uh, that I hung up on the wall. Uh, so <laughs> we got that projector in here now. It's 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 awesome. I'm in the projector. I guess you can see my fit. Okay. Oh, the wire. There we go. Still on. Yeah, sat down there. <laughs> so, uh, hey, King, uh, little King of the Kill, what do you say? Oh yeah, are you on the on the uh, Discord server? You can join the Discord server, and there's like what I like about Discord is they have this thing like it's kind of like um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I used chat rooms back in the day, and everyone has like their ICQ and all that, and uh, I, I use Yahoo Chat until I started converting over to Linux, and then I uh, I guess I can do this. Yeah, uh, I was doing Yahoo Chat until I like I converted over to Linux, and then with Linux, um, Yahoo Chat didn't work in Linux. But I guess you can use what was the thing that we used? Uh, Pigeon. We well, could use Pigeon, but it didn't do the voice chat thing. And that's what I really like about Discord these days is because like um, it basically has that voice chat. You can get like I don't know how many people can be on a video chat with Discord, but quite a lot, and it's free. So it's 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 better than Zoom in my opinion. And uh, yeah, we do meetings on uh, on Discord all the time. You're on your uh, King of the Kill. Um, you got your daughter with you. She's trying to say hi, but can't. Say, uh, yeah. um, you're on your iPad, unfortunately, right now. I'm watching live through YouTube. Yeah, Pigeon was awesome. So was Gain. Oh, yeah, I never used Gain. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if I can connect to Discord through uh, using those apps, but I, I think with Discord, it's probably going to be something with all the technology that's in it. It's going to be proprietary. And uh, uh, I think when I switched over to Linux, and that was like probably, two, I, I like to say 2005 or 2006, uh, or, yeah, or seven, or, uh, when I started converting over to Ubuntu, because um, I had Windows XP at the time. Well, actually, I got Vista. And I didn't like Vista. Nobody liked Vista. Uh, maybe some people did, but I, I didn't like Vista. So I converted over to um, oh, uh, the stream. There is uh, is a uh, did a circle. Um, so I switched over to Ubuntu, and that was becoming a popular thing at the time. It was the brown, ugly Ubuntu stuff. Um, I didn't mind it. I actually thought that was kind of cool. It was different. It was um, you know, it, it was always customizable. You could change it to whatever you would you would want it. And then I switched. Uh, yeah, I used Ubuntu for quite like right up till about two thousand and nine, 
And that's when they changed over to Unity, and then a lot of people didn't like Unity. I was probably one of the people that didn't like Unity. I didn't like using it. So I ended up switching over to Linux Mint, which is Ubuntu-based. It just had more of a uh, kind of like a Windows feel to using it. And I just wanted, I didn't care about really the computer stuff. I just wanted to have something that I could switch over um, or something I could, you know, easily use. Just basically get on the internet at that time. Um, that that's what I was doing a lot. I wasn't even doing videos in the early early 2010s, I guess. I didn't really start work like I did videos before, but then I kind of like uh, had a break from it. I guess I was uh, just doing other jobs, and then um, yeah, and at that time it was like doing video editing in Linux would would have really sucked at the time too, because like the editors were terrible. But luckily, when I had my first daughter, who's around uh, nine years old now, um, I did a lot of home videos. I was doing home videos before. And then um, I would uh, use Caden Live, and I've been using Caden Live for years now. And I could uh, like edit our home videos on that. And I didn't put that on the internet. I just you know had them as uh, MKV MP4 files so that I can you know watch them on a media box, which now we use a smart TV. But back like ten years ago, I was pretty much using like media boxes all the time because they didn't have uh, smart TVs. <sighs> The good old days of Ubuntu, yeah. I still like Ubuntu, and I think with Ubuntu, all I need to do is install the KDE, is what this video is about. Uh, try and KDE Plasma. If you don't like Unity, uh, try it with the KDE Plasma, because I think that would bring a lot of people back to Ubuntu, um, or use the uh, KDE. I don't know if they even have Kubuntu anymore. <laughs> I think it probably still is a thing. Um... This is, uh, that's back when I was still using the boxes, Suzy, the boxed Suzy Linux up to 10. Maybe you can ask, answer this one, um, Little King of the Kill. Um, did Suzy Linux, I remember it was either Future Shop or Best Buy. You, I went in the store and I saw this box. It was a Linux um, box that you bought at Best Buy. And I can't remember exactly what it was. Or if it was Suzy or if it was Red Hat. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, I didn't bite at that time. That was prior, like to Ubuntu. That was probably a few years before. Um, when I bought when I bought the Windows XP expansion pack or something like that, or no, I bought had ninety eight, so I got Windows XP, and then I, I looked in the store and there was like this Linux thing, uh, and I forget what distro it was, but they were selling it at the, and I can't remember if it was Future Shop or Best Buy. I know that they're merged now, but back then there was two different stores. I like that comment there, little king on the kill. Um, OMG, video editing in Linux is now my option. Opinion is better than Mac, which is really amazing to someone say. I use it all the time. I, I'm a Kaden KD, Live user. I'm very uh, into my Kaden Live for editing videos. Um, I've tried other editors, and I, I, all my, a lot of my friends, they prefer um, a shortcut and different, uh, different uh, types of editors, but I guess I... And I think a lot of this, like uh, one of my friends who uses like the really old nonlinear system, you, sometimes you get into a system and you really like that and you don't want to move around. Like I tried all of it and all of it was really amazing. They had some really good features to all of, but uh, it just, um, I, I still will use Kate, Kaden Live. Although I hate how they changed, like they up, when they updated Kaden Live, there's a few things that I hated that, like in the rendering process, I remember the uh, consistent bit rate, and I always edited my videos consistent bit rate. I knew how big the file would be. Where now it's like I try the, the this very the what, what they have set up now, and it always like um, I'm trying to figure out how to re-render a video because it was too big, and then I had to render it again, and it was too it was the right size, but the video quality was not good. So like it doesn't tell you how like. You know a whole lot of information about the bitrate, which I wish they they would put that in in uh, Caden Live. Love KDE. I got a Pine Buck Pro. Oh, that'd be kind of cool to play around with. It was Best Buy. Okay, your uh, little king of the kill says it was Best Buy. They carried both, both uh, Susie and Red Hat. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Cause, you know what? I, I used to see Dennis office. I thought that was kind of cool. This Dennis office that I used to be a courier and do deliveries. And I go in this Dennis office and I'd see um, Susie Lennox running in the background. I say, like, oh, cool. And the, and the ladies that were working in the office, they had no idea what it was. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's uh, just what they had to work with. Man, they also uh, also carried Mandrake to the uh, Mandrake. Okay, cool. And the Forgotten Lindos, lol. Okay, there's like a Lindos, like a parody of Windows uh, that uh, was out. Uh, I didn't see that one. That's uh, that's kind of funny. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I I never even noticed like uh, operating systems. Um, I never heard of o, like OS Warp, the IBM operating system. I knew there was DOS back in the day, and I guess I would understand that like you know like the late nineties. I wanted like computers were crazy expensive. I never had one. I never had like an Atari. I guess the one I wanted back in the ni early nineties was an Atari ST. And um, I guess I'm kind of glad I didn't get one. I should have got an, Ami an Amiga is what I should have gotten now. But um, And they all had their different operating systems. The funny thing is some of those computers now, if you have an Atari ST or an Amiga, they're like, um, if you go on eBay, the prices on them are more expensive than a new computer. Which is kind of silly, but I guess they're collectible hardware now. And then, uh, so yeah, I had that and we had, um, or no, at that time I had a Commodore 64. And then when we got like our 486 had Windows 3.1 on it, and Windows 3.1 was um, uh, something. I mean, I used Windows 3.1 in school. Um, I'm I'm uh, how old am I? 44. So we had like uh, Windows 3.1 um, in high school. That's what I saw on a lot of computers. I think there was a few DOS. Like it had DOS, and then if you wanted to use Windows, you would type Win W I N, and Windows 3.1 would load up um in high school and i think eventually we got one of those at home uh and then we got 98 and i used the 98 machine for a while and then uh so yeah i didn't get windows 95 we got 98 by the time we got a new computer and then uh after that i got xp he used xp for a bunch of years and then switched to linux and it was really because i liked windows xp windows xp was great i mean it crashed on me a few times in, in um that was kind of the point where I didn't know how to install my own operating system, but I learned because uh, Windows XP would crash. Like, because I ran that for years, and then what would happen with uh, Windows XP is, um, you know, that, um, after so many years of putting in different programs that you don't know what you're installing, uh, <laughs> the whole thing crashes. You need to reinstall everything. And when I uh, discovered Linux, it was great because, like, um, and I probably in the beginning of using Ubuntu, I probably um, crashed a few, I messed things up so bad that I just had to reinstall everything on the hard drive. And uh, which had a video to go to, Vincent? <laughs> Are you back yet? Yeah, I shared this over on Facebook today. Starting, just checking out my notifications here. <sighs> the buffering is kind of messed up here. Oh, I see Vincent's coming back there. I see the, the screen moving. He's trying to figure his audio out. I hear you now, Vincent. Uh, uh, okay, I, I don't know. I was using a USB interface, and it was it was saying it was working, but I guess it wasn't. Anyway. Now, the audience should be able to hear you and me. Yay! Computers, everyone! Oh, you cut out there, Vincent. Oh, oh wait, no. It's, uh, maybe it's my internet. Okay. Okay. I see, you your, I see your webcam and, on Discord, and I hear you. Good. I hear you through Discord. I don't know uh, through the uh, uh, YouTube feed here. Yeah. My YouTube feed for your our your stream there it's uh it's buffering right now. Hmm. Okay. Um. I, I'm just gonna go take a leak. I'll be right back. <clears throat> All right. I will try and troubleshoot the streaming here. So, folks, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop the stream out and then come back because I think it's uh the bit rate should be fine for what we're sending, but just to be safe. 
I'm going to go ahead and drop it down a little bit, so bear with me. Uh, we'll be right back. Okay. That ought to do it. Are we back? Let's see. Uh, what's YouTube saying? Yeah, uh, as if I got to do more live programming. Yeah, I'd like to. I'm thinking about doing one live show every week. Probably Fridays is going to be the... You're here loud and clear. All right, that's good. I'm glad to see that it, it might be cooperating now. Uh, so I did drop the bit rate down a little bit, but it might be working. So that's the, that's the good news. We're going to wait for Robbie to return, and uh, hopefully that will be pretty soon but we'll see and of course Robbie's back right here I just muted your audio on the air and then as soon as I did that you came back that's perfect timing well I hope you didn't hear me in the background <laughs> I, I just heard a little bit of the room I didn't hear you I guess it canceled it um yeah so let me let me see here I'm gonna just quickly put us both up on the screen so for those at, at home that are wondering how I'm doing this I have got a black magic design video switcher and uh, it's it's pretty powerful and there here we go me and Ravi on the same no, we're on the same screen yeah there we go yeah there we go so, to, uh, I hear the discord but then the YouTube's like delayed by 20 seconds yeah I would mute the YouTube you're getting all the audio yeah there. Yeah, I muted the uh, I muted yeah. YouTube. Yeah, that's a good idea. But no, yeah, the YouTube's going to be a bit delayed. I restarted the stream because apparently it was cutting out for people on the actual. Okay, okay. Yeah, it was. You know what? Yeah, I'm still on the same uh, link because yeah. I haven't changed it. If you restart it, the the encoder within about 20 seconds, it won't it won't cut out. So that's that's why I was able to do that. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to drop the bit rate because uh, like. The speed test was saying I could do six megs, but I've dropped this down to about four, and it seems to stabilize. So I don't know what's going on. Maybe my SP. They don't the like six megs. I don't know. My I always do my church stream. I like six megs up, and they're always saying no, that's too much. But it's like six meg video is like for 720p decent quality video is what I'd want. <laughs> yeah, I mean like 720p at. Um, you know, like five or six megs, I think looks pretty good. You know, eight two six four, but I feel like it would be nice to be a little higher end. You know, if you're going to go, especially ten eighty. Um, you know, so y YouTube. That's another thing about them. It's like their bit rates is that's something that made me want to build my own stuff. Is the fact that I can control those bit rates, which yeah, again, yeah. you know, it's a it's a constant equation of well, yes, you want to control the bit rates, but you also want to make sure that you don't go a little too far because the bit rates, you know, that you're talking about a increase in bandwidth every single time that you know you're increasing, you know, the videos on the site and everything, and then also just the actual individual bit rate being increased you know on a per video so you know it's like trying to find a happy medium between where it can be vp9 uh which is an open source codec that google developed i wish it had bit better support it does in a lot of stuff but that codec it's like the open source h.265 and on that you know the bit rate is really good um i, I so i've been doing some experimenting with mpeg dash and vp9 and you can get the bit rate down pretty low and still have a really good 1080p image so you know, what I'm thinking I may do with my, my website where I'm going to be streaming is just say, look, Chrome supports VP9, Firefox supports VP9, use one of those. Sorry. <laughs> if you want open yeah. source, use Firefox. If you're cool or proprietary, you can use Chrome. The only real catch is that on iOS, there literally is no way to play it. So that's the problem. And on Mac OS, you can't use Safari to play it. But Again, Google Chrome is like 80-something percent of the browser market. Is it really that bad to to lose that little percentage? I don't necessarily think it's too bad. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, I got Chrome on my computer, but I got other browsers, too, that I'll use. And, um, um, well, for, for, for when you mo run multiple accounts, too, you want to put some, some accounts maybe on one browser and another accounts on other browsers, uh, also for security, also just like, if you're using multiple services with different accounts, too. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, you do want to be able to do that. Uh, I know I do that where it's like, 
you know, I'll do certain accounts like that, or I'll do like certain accounts in a incognito in Firefox, and then one in like a regular. I guess it's not incognito in uh, Firefox. It's what uh, private browser. Can you tell I used Chrome for a really long time, people? I'm using all the the terminology. But yeah, no, uh, that's something I will do. I've even seen extensions out there before, and I want to say Firefox has a built-in feature that will do this, where it can actually like not keep the cookies on like another tab. So you could like have Facebook. You know, well, I guess it wouldn't be Facebook because you're not allowed to have more than one account. But maybe YouTube. Uh, if you like have like the old, you know, like the old YouTube channels, you had to make like a separate, like complete Google account and everything yeah. for back in the day. If you had two of those, I, I, I was on YouTube so long ago. Like, they, they used to have a YouTube, uh, but this is like in 2006, seven. They had the YouTube Director account, which is kind of like their. It was before monetization, it was, but it was like. If you, uh, if you want to have videos over, like, because YouTube used to have this thing where all the videos were, could be longer than 10 minutes. I don't know if you remember that far back. I do. I, yeah. I was using it back then. Goodness, that's, yeah. that's been a while, ain't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and then you used to have to, like, people would put videos and they'd be like part one of two, part three, you know, and you'd have to go find the parts of these. And you put it together as a, as a playlist, but you couldn't upload, like, more than a 10 minute long video. And thank goodness they don't do that anymore. But it, there was this feature they had a long time ago. It didn't last very long. Where it was the YouTube director account. And if you're a YouTube director, you could uh, have videos for, like, basically how you, it is now. Except the video quality then was not as good as it is now. Like, video quality is a lot better now. And, oh, yeah, yeah. another thing about Bitrate and running it on your own website. Like, I, I used to have my own website and server um or rented a server and i remember if you got a video that got like a ton of like got lots of downloads it actually you got over you got extra charges to your bandwidth because yeah you, you want to serve that over a cdn because that's yeah. you're not going to get over charges on a cdn but you will yeah uh, oh, that, that was years ago that was yeah. like i won't even bother doing that i just i just use whatever server free services are available now yeah uh, i don't really pay to have uh i mean for people that might want to put up a website yeah for sure yeah, and you know the thing about it is like so I'm using I'm using DigitalOcean uh, Spaces and their costs are pretty low so you know but that's why I'm willing to do it maybe for a little while for basically nothing but the goal is to get advertisers uh, you know to where that I will be able to you know recoup my costs but that being said uh, you know if it was to get really expensive uh, full disclosure folks the website may just put up a message saying we're done. <laughs> We're, we're, we've used enough bandwidth for the month. Y'all come back next month to watch some more stuff or something, you know? But, uh, I haven't seen, uh, YouTube, I haven't seen though, sites do that in a long time. Yeah, but YouTube... Well, I would. <laughs> but YouTube, <laughs> YouTube though, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, it's funny. People talk about how bad the quality on YouTube is now. I'm, I'm showing my age here. Um, and I was on YouTube in the early, early years, too, as a little baby. I wasn't even supposed to have a YouTube account, but I did anyway. <laughs> uh, it wasn't this one, so YouTube, be nice. Let's not get rid of the account. That account I don't even really use anymore. But anyway, that, but uh, I remember the videos, you know, they were like 144p, I think, if memory serves, or was it 240? I think I think 240 was like the high quality version that they brought out like a yeah, year later. Oh, or yeah, it? yeah. If you go to my channel and you look at like some of the early stuff I uploaded, it's like really awful video quality. But it's still up there, but and it's and it's impossible to search unless you actually go to a channel, and like click on the tab for like oldest videos, because I had videos uploaded in two thousand six, that are still there, and the quality is like I re-uploaded them because once they started doing better video quality, um, uh, there's like a re-upload video a version of that video up there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's probably a good idea to do. The video quality is absurd with like early YouTube. I, I you know, I, 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 at one point I had this in my Twitter bio, whatever you call it, profile, whatever. And it literally, it's a joke now, but at the time I actually said this, um, 360p is all you need because I had slow internet and I was watching even when they had high resolution I usually just watch 360 I'm like this is good enough you know and now I can't believe I ever was satisfied with 360p that is you know to be fair I wasn't watching programming videos and stuff back then like I do sometimes now and that I think that's the really the biggest use case for anything above 720 on YouTube like us talking right now I don't think most people would care if this is 720 uh, but on the other hand, if it were doing code, I think people would be like, oh, I can't read that code, you know, or showing like fine details, like in a GUI. Yeah. Well, what I find with YouTube is too, we're actually, they were going to the 4k and like really pushing 4k videos. If you shot in 4k and uploaded all your videos in 4k, now YouTube is pushing their shorts. 
So they want the friggin' portrait. I don't have a portrait of a cell phone with me, but here we have the portrait here of like uh, Han Solo, and you know, it's his portrait, right? And uh, it's like um, all the videos have gone down in quality now because everything's shot in portrait mode. Yeah, you know, portrait mode is in my mind just I I never have cared for it. Uh, vertical video, as the professionals often call, it. I hate it. It just it's. <laughs> I, 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 you know, at the end of the day, people say, well, you might as well get used to it because they're going away. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware. It probably won't go away anytime soon. I won't click on a video if it's shot in portrait mode unless it's really like um, something I really want to see. But uh, I mean, oh, it's awful. People like shoot their vi their TV and they share a news story that they saw on TV and they shoot it on portrait mode with their phone and they're like, uh, and they re upload that to the internet. That's like the viral video that we got. Somebody couldn't capture that video off of uh, the news. Yeah, I mean, come on, really? It's uh, how hard is it to turn your phone ninety degrees? Like, you know, I, I'm not even much of a cell phone person, as you all probably can tell. I'm a lot more of a video guy, so that you know, the professional world, you normally do sixteen by nine, uh, or at least one of the widescreen formats, like two to one and such. And I'm, you know, this is being shot on a cinema camera, so I'm not really the YouTube. It's like I'm gonna shoot all everything on my smartphone. But if you are gonna be one of those people, I went to uh, school with a girl that actually she makes YouTube videos about music. And she she actually makes videos on her cell phone, but credit where it's due, she turns her phone 90 degrees. Thank you, you yeah. know. So I can actually stand to watch her videos, you know. Um, anyway, but regardless of that, uh, I doubt anybody's really interested in her channel. Uh, but she talks about the Beatles. I don't even have the link handy. But regardless of that, like she, you know, she's on a, a phone. Yeah, I, I guess she still probably shoots on an iPhone. Years ago when I talked to her, she's like, yeah, I shoot everything on my cell phone. And I'm like, yeah, of course you do. Uh, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, a cell phone, I think for most people, is good enough, right? But It is good enough now. Like, you, you got to compare the technology now, too. Like, I shoot a lot of my home videos on a cell phone. And that's like, it still is more superior than the quality I used to get on a, like, $2,000 Super VHS Panasonic oh. camcorder. Oh, yeah. Like, like, and that thing was huge, right? But the thing is, the little cell phone is better quality than that. Now, my Canon camcorder is going to look a lot nicer. Even my, just my, my small little uh, 1080p Canon camcorder, it will still look nicer than a cell phone video. But uh, um, I'm, I've got moved up to the 4k camera now and it's uh it's just uh i, I like to shoot a lot of my like even the home video stuff uh with uh, the 4k video because like when i work with it later in a few years when hard drives are cheaper and stuff like that i'll still be using the uh the canon uh, 4k camcorder and it's also it's just what kind of necessary for youtube because uh if you want to check that box off for 4k so that more people will watch on a smart tv yeah, you know, my plan is to eventually do 4K. This camera shoots 6K, so that's what you need to do, Rob. You need to upgrade, you know, it's it's time. 4K is last week's format. It's oh, 6K. Oh, gosh, yeah. I <laughs> know. Uh, Actually, I do have problems with the 4K footage on the hard drive, but I think I, I, I put a hard drive in, and it lags. And uh, it's, a, it's a hard disk drive. Um, so it's not an uh, SSD, it's like an actual hard disk. But I, yeah, my other hard drive, it was only a two terabyte. I think it had a read faster write speed. I just bought a cheap hard drive and put it in, hoping that it would work. And it did work at first, but now that it's over half full of video, it's starting to, um, when I'm running videos on Caden Live, just the preview mode is kind of laggy, but it could be um, my um, my preview settings too. I could lower that, but the thing with Caden Live, it's a little tricky to figure out how to get the preview settings um, just to work in the mode that I would want it to do, just to play the video on the fly real quick. And I don't care about the quality, I just want to have it in the preview mode so it looks decent enough so when I do my edits, it doesn't lag, it just plays the video the way it would. When it renders it in the final product, that's where I want it to look nice. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the thing about Caden Live is it, the graphics acceleration on it is what acceleration? I mean, technically they've got it in the settings, when I try to turn it on, it crashes, it's, you know, Every time I talk about Caden Live, I complain about this. And I, I don't want to make everybody think I hate Caden Live. I don't. I just really like it when I hit play and the video looks perfect during playback. Especially, I mean, I've had to do that on HD uh, even. Uh, but it's a lot better still. So, like, you yeah. know, the, the reality of it is that could be part of it. Another thing, too, though, is, I mean, you know, 4K files are a lot bigger. It depends on what codec it's into. I know, for example, that 4K ProRes, I find edits much smoother than 4K H.265, for example, or H.264. So if you had to pick a, <laughs> a codec, this camera that I'm shooting on right now shoots 
and ProRes all the way up to 4 res 422 HQ, which is huge data rates, which is you really have to put it on an SSD because then you will drop frames because it's just I don't I don't yeah. think there's a spinning drive that can go that fast. Maybe there is, but you're going to probably spend a lot of money on it. Uh, but you know, it, you also can shoot raw on this thing and the raw files are even a little bit bigger than the ProRes. So for me, uh, you know, 4K, I'm shooting in 4K pretty much everything, but I don't upload in 4K. And the reason I'm doing that is because one day one day my plan is to remaster the videos in 4K UHD uh, slash HDR because I, this will also do high dynamic range. But right now YouTube's support of it is complicated. And from what I've heard, not very good. And my test uh, converting to SDR, which is what most people are looking at still. So like as far as I'm concerned, like in 10 years, I want to have the 4K files to go back to. But they're huge, especially if you you know, are shooting Perez or, or raw. So, you know, I think 4k, I think for most people though, to this day is really overkill. It is. It is. It's funny. I find really one reason why I want to honestly be in 4k is just to be like, and honestly that I'm 4k shooting 4k in the search results. And that's the only reason I think the videos that I do, like what I'm mostly like niching in is it's tutorials and you don't need tutorials really in ultra high definition 4k. It's just, uh, it's just something in the search algorithm you get boost i think you're going to get boosted better if you actually have the, that 4k option yeah and i mean that you know that might be the case um you know it wouldn't surprise me like youtube i, I want to say a lot of people thought that they boosted hd videos back in the day right if you you know posted in hd when people weren't doing that so that's probably true that that's that it's happening uh the other thing too though is i think tutorials could be good in 4k because and I'll tell you why. If you're showing a lot of fine detail on the screen, I think that could start to make oh, yeah. a lot more sense, right? You know, for again, for computer tutorials, that would be nice. Yeah, but like gardening, how to you know garden stuff like that. No, I think something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I mean, realistically, I think for most use cases, 4K is just honestly more of a hassle than it's worth. I mean, you know, a lot of movies are still projected in 2K, which is actually not that much bigger than broadcast HD. It's slightly bigger. It's, yeah, it sounds like it would be half a 4K, but it's not really. That, yeah, that's just the way I, that it's naming convention. I, per, I personally don't care myself. Like it's more yeah. just like for the viewers. And um, like even the I have a video projector here, and I'm pretty sure this thing it advertises that it does 1080p, but I think it actually does like uh, it's a cheap Vianco projector, and it I'm pretty sure it does like a, a 720p. But my family, we don't really care. We just want you know have a fun feel uh, for the movie night and sit down here and watch video on a projector. So. Uh, it doesn't have to be like if I were to buy another projector, I might buy a uh, better quality one. But right now, I mean, this one does does what I need it to do. And uh, yeah, I, I know there's some people. Oh, they have to have an 8K projector and have to have the best things in the world. But I'm like, I'll just I'll, I'll, this one is like cost next to nothing. So so yeah. it's worth worth worthwhile for. Yeah. Um, and that same thing is like with uh, cell phones. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to render out my home videos uh, with my kids. And I actually want to make a, uh, a a smaller file, but it looks decent, 720p yeah. uh, render of it. Because most of the time, for a lot of the time, they watch it either on this projector here or they're going to watch it on a, on a tablet. So you don't need 4K on a tablet, even though it's shot in 4K. So I just want like a nice rendered uh, 720p file. That will be nice and small that I can store on the SD card of the uh, of the tablet, so we have our home videos backed up uh, on a portable device. Yeah, and I mean you can use things like FFmpeg to to do that. That's what I'm doing. I've got an archive script that will well, I don't convert to 720, but I've got an archive script that will do a bunch of stuff to the videos for archive. So it will go and take oh. like the ProRes files and make up H.265, and then it will upload them to a cloud store I have that's privated automatically. I've wrote some code to do all that, and the reason I did it is because again. Yeah, H.264 to edit is not the best experience, but for storage, it's much better. And I mean, you know, especially, you know, I want to keep the 4K because, again, I want to be able to go back and master in 4K in the future. And with that, you know, you do like a 10 meg per second H.265 on a 4K ProRes. To me, it looks lossless. I mean, technically, I'm sure it isn't, but at the end of the day, if I can't tell and I'm... It seems like I've noticed I'm usually the pickiest 
person in the audience. Like I, I post videos all the time where I think that that I was a little soft, you know, on focus. Someone's gonna complain about it. No one ever notices. Now watch, somebody's gonna go back and find that video I'm talking about. There's a couple of them and be like, oh, it's, it's, the focus is off. Yeah, like two years later. Yeah, sure, it was really a big deal, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> but like, we, you know, you I, know I think most people, if the audio <laughs> sounds good, you can yeah. probably be just fine. Technology, like there already is technology now too, where you can upscale uh, old video content and make it 4K. Like take old uh, even 4 480p uh, video and upscale it, and uh, there's software that will you know fix up fix that up for you. Um, so I, I mean, who knows what the future would have, right? Where you could take old footage and make it look like uh, shot on film, right? Well, sh yeah, shot on a very high resolution. You know, I mean, I will say this: there is the AI tools out there now, but I find that they're not really completely ready for prime time. I haven't tested all of them. I've just played with a few of them. I've seen. There's nothing in Linux for that. I know. It's, it, well, all that would be that, on the proprietary side right now, but yeah, I, actually, I want to say one of the proprietary ones I think has a Linux desktop app. Come to think of it, but regardless of that, the issue that I really have with it is that none of them do it perfectly, and no. a lot of them they want to upscale to the. Uh, fun fact, I'm a really big fan of 2 followed by 4 for a frame rate, in case anyone picked up on that. A lot of them want to upscale to 60 and stuff. And it's like, well, look, if you want that, fine. You can upscale it to 60. But my videos, I, I really... The only reason you're even seeing this in 30 right now, folks, is because YouTube, if you give them 24, up converts it these days. Which is another reason I want to have my own service, because then uh, I'm going to put a graphic on the YouTube only feed saying, hey, you want to see this without it looking weird? Go over here! <laughs> <laughs> that may or may not prove to be a good strategy, uh, but that's, you know, that's that's the thing. They up convert it, and I find they don't do a perfect job because, well, it's pretty much impossible to, without AI, and even then, it's still not perfect, I find, to up convert frame rates. But anyway, regardless of that, like, I think most people, as long as the audio is good, you know, like, I mean, there's YouTube videos from years ago that's got a lot of views on it that was 15 frames a second, which I find <laughs> abhorrent to even look at, you know. Um, you know, like to me, 24 is, you know, it's 24 is where it's at. It's just, it's enough data that it looks good and it looks filmic and, you know, it's not too many frames where it starts to look like TV, but it's also not so few. It starts to look like something that was crap and shot on a smartphone 20 years ago. So it's like, you know, it's, it's a good middle ground, I think, you know, for, for, for frame rate. But regardless, um, yeah, I think these days most consumers would be happy with a smartphone and for a camera. And I think most consumers would be happy with... 720 or 1080, you know, and I, I know the audience that's watching this is probably the exception to that rule. Us geeks, we're like, oh, we, we want that 4K, and you know, we, you know, we, you know, we want all that kind of stuff. But fun fact, I don't even have a 4K monitor. The closest I have is this right here. It's I'm using it's old TV monitors. It. Yeah, and I mean, like, you know, I, I, I thought about getting a 4K TV that was on Black Friday sale the other day. That was UHD 4K, and it also had the. Uh, what was it? The uh, HDR support as well, HDR10 and things like that in it. And I thought that would be kind of fun to play with. But again, I don't really feel the need. You know, nothing I'm watching really screams this has to be an HDR. This has to be an um, 4K resolution. None of it really says that to me. You know, programming tutorials is like the one thing I think 4K would really, at least for me, be like, yeah, I might want that. Because even in 1080, if I don't full screen the video, it's a little fuzzy, like to read. Most small non, non, non geek people that I know, they probably would want like um, a smart TV. They don't even care about the resolution. They don't know. You know they think it's a HD TV, but you know, because they they don't even know what 4K is. And uh, but they want a smart TV because that's probably what they heard about, right? A smart TV that um, uh, gives them uh, Netflix and that sort of thing is what basically what they're looking for. They're probably not even thinking that YouTube's available on it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I will say this, as far as, like, video uh, goes, like I said, just most people, I really don't think they're really concerned. I mean, like, my mother, for example, she doesn't care, you know? She's watched stuff that's 480 and she's happy, right? I think a lot of people are in that boat where it's like, the audio's good enough, the content's good enough, they're not too picky past that's that why, point. That's why VHS beat beta. It was so marginal how much better VH, or, uh, beta was than VHS. It was very marginal. So it was uh, only like a uh, you know, real video geek would notice the difference, right? Yeah. And, 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 and we're, we're the people that probably in this call and watching the stream that would be like, oh, yeah, beta was better. <laughs> but 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 I bet your grandma was like, "What's the difference, right?" Yeah, and everything was available. I don't know. I I'm I'm, a, I'm still old enough to remember when video stores had a beta and a VHS section. 
Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite that old, so... Yeah, it, it, but anyway, yeah, that was the format, and then then it became DVD, and now like I don't know, there's stuff uh, that uh, that streaming now looks better than DVD. So and then you don't really see any storable media anymore. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, the, if you look at like a Blu-ray or something like that. I ha- I don't personally have a Blu-ray, player, but I've seen them, and you know, a high bitrate Blu-ray is going to look better than a Netflix. Oh, or yeah, something. It will, it, but yeah, it will. But the yeah. reality of it is is that a lot of the stuff I want to watch is streaming originals and they don't have DVD and, and you know, such releases. Uh, I've never so, been a video guy that I'm, I've never owned the Blu-ray player. That was one thing that surpassed me as a Blu-ray. I, I was waiting for, I, you know, and the only thing that really stopped me from doing that is I didn't want to have another device that I had to plug in the wall. I wanted to get like something that I like got and they never made it because I was still using VHS. I wanted a VHS uh, Blu-ray player, you know, so I could have like one unit that does it all. Because I had a DVD VHS player. Yep. You know, but I didn't have. There was no Blu-ray VHS player, so I never, never moved on to Blu-ray because of that. Yeah, I, I, I was a, a holdout on VHS for a long time just because it was good enough, and we had a lot of VHS tapes of things. You know, who wants to rebuy, you know, hundreds of movies? You know, uh, for example, on, you know, DVD. Yes, it looks better. Don't get me wrong. I am not a big fan of VHS then or now, but it was good enough. And It was good enough, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And th- the thing about it is, is that if you look, that's what most people care about. And Blu-ray for me, what it really came down to for, for me and my family, I've always been kind of the one that pushes our technology forward. My parents would have probably been happy with a CRT sitting on their table right now if it you know, wasn't for me. <laughs> but, like, the reality of it is, is that for me and my CRT family... <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, we actually still got them, but we don't ever use them. But, like, the reality of it is, is that for us, it was really coming down to two things. One, it wasn't that big of a difference for the cost. And two... Even if it came down in price, by the time it did that, which it has done a lot, it's still not super cheap. Uh, but the other thing is, like, when you've got the fact that you can watch a large, I mean, ridiculously large library on, a, say, a Netflix or a Hulu or a Disney Plus of programming, and in very good quality. I mean, again, like, to my eyes, sure, there is different pieces of say a netflix show or something where you can see compression artifacts you can see uh you know very minor ones like macro blocking where you've got these little boxes that show up you can see that occasionally Uh, video compression that stuff like netflix and youtube uses in dark environments you can see a lot of that and you can see a lot of other artifacts but the reality of it is i'm one of very few people and if you're one of these people you probably are too most people can't tell they aren't looking for that kind of stuff. And for years, I didn't notice it either. When I started to notice it is when I really got into video, when you know, when I was growing up as a kid. And then I started to notice these artifacts more and more as you were kind of analyzing it, you know, pixel peeping as we might call it today, you know, and being like, oh, well, why does this video look slightly worse than that video? You know, or why is it if you upload it to YouTube, does it look worse than if it's local, etc.? And, you know, there's a lot of factors that come in that. But most people just... I really don't think they care. Also, we got a question in the chat a few minutes ago. Sorry, I'm just now getting to it. Michael said, uh, quick question, what is a good video editing program for Linux or Mac OS that is best for super simple video editing? Nothing fancy, just super simple basic video editing. Uh, personally, I would say on Linux, Caden Live is probably good enough for that task. I'd say Robbie would agree. considering he hey, K- it. Caden Live or OpenShot? OpenShot is pretty basic and... Uh... Um, simple yeah. to use, I think. Uh, Actually, OpenShot might even be better because the UI, unless yep. it's changed, is pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's pretty simple and straightforward for OpenShot. Uh, I haven't looked at OpenShot. I heard that there was like a bunch of professional features that you can unlock in OpenShot, but I I don't really play around with it too much because I'm most of the time I'm using Caden Live. So, um, um, but yeah, I, I should probably download it again and just give it a try. I probably do have it on my computer. I just never use it. And that's the nice thing about Linux. It's free software, right? So it's easy. What you can simply do is try, you know, just download OpenShot, download... Um, and something we both uh, reviewed when we uh, first uh, first came out was Olive. When Olive first came out. I don't know what's... I don't know if there's been much been happening with Olive. Not uh, that I'm aware of. But, yeah. yeah, I'm not 100% sure about that. But, yeah. Um, 
All of them is another one that I liked, uh, but I my preference would be with Caden and Live, and and every editor is going to have their preference. I, I when I when you talk to editors, I, I, I you know, a lot of them have their preference of what they like working with, uh, what uh, and what works well in their workflow. Yeah, exactly, and I mean you know that's the thing. I think editing software it's a pretty personal choice. I mean for me, I really like DaVinci Resolve. And that's that's where I'm at these days. It's funny because a while back I got a mean comment on you saying use DaVinci Resolve. What was funny? I was already using DaVinci Resolve when they sent that. So to be fair, I hadn't really talked about it publicly yet. So it's not like they knew unless they were spying on me, which I guess they weren't. Because uh, <laughs> if they had been, they I assume wouldn't have typed that unless they wanted to throw me off their trail. I'm not but a conspiracy you, you, theorist. I'm just trying to be funny, folks. But in all seriousness, wondering. yeah, I yeah. I think. When I found you, you were talking about, like when I found you on YouTube a couple of years ago. You were talking about DaVinci and you were talking about um, Olive, and uh, I was trying out both those editors at that time. And so uh, I remember finding one of your videos and I thought, "Well, how's this guy uh, uh, getting along with uh, with those editors?" And uh, I, I tr- is the DaVinci Resolve? Do you still need CentOS to make it run, or will it run in anything now? Officially, it's been sent to us for years, but unofficially, you can get it to run on almost anything. I got it on Ubuntu 2004, okay, and yeah, it yeah. and it runs pretty good. You know, the biggest problem I have with DaVinci on Linux is really two things. One of them is I feel like we're second class citizens as Linux users of DaVinci because the Mac yeah. and the Windows build gets things we don't get first. But you can make the argument, well, they're the bigger platforms, and we eventually do get stuff brought down to us. But you know, you got to be a little more patient. Um, the other thing that is a, a bit of an annoyance with DaVinci is, and this kind of comes back to the second class citizen, is we don't get window borders on DaVinci Resolve's main window. Now, you know, I used to be very annoyed by that. At this point, you know, it goes, it fills up the whole, like, screen, except for, like, your dock on, like, say, a GNOME system. It's fine. With the KDE stuff, one of the reasons I actually was playing a KDE a while back is uh, there is actually K window rules you can use, and somebody put a one in there, which will basically force... DaVinci to have it on all their windows. Thank you, Caden, uh, not Caden, live, but uh, KDE for having that feature. KDE, yeah. But I just don't really care for KDE. Like it's, I thought about switching to that desktop for that one reason, Just, but I just really like GNOME and you get used to the way the shortcuts and everything work. But regardless, like that's really my only major complaint, at least for me, now that's for me. But the one thing that isn't a distinction that I should bring up that comes to mind is if you want to use DaVinci on Linux, Unless you're on the Studio Edition, H.264 and 5 do not decode, it, because they won't they won't use the open source libraries. Uh, probably due to some kind of a licensing patent oh, complication. Yeah, yeah. That being said, my camera shoots ProRes and B-RAW. It supports both of those on Linux, so I don't really care about this problem. But if you care about it, you know a lot of people's cameras are shooting one of those formats, so that's why I bring it up. The other thing on that is, if you get the Studio Edition, that will be fixed. With the Studio Edition. Um, I don't remember if AAC audio works, but I know that the H.264 and 5 works. But on the free version, yeah, yeah, AAC doesn't was... work either. And, you know, the solution to that is, one, either don't use it, or, two, you can convert your files to, like, a DNX HD or a ProRes for, like, a That's temporary. the big thing that turned me off of DaVinci is because I haven't jumped through all those hoops. And uh, it was just something I just wasn't willing to do. And uh, maybe someday I will once uh, DaVinci's come along further and I'll... Um, I guess I wouldn't pay for it though. That's the that's the problem. So I wouldn't get the uh, the the license version. Well, the thing about the license version is I technically didn't pay for it. And no, I don't mean I pirated it. To clarify, if you buy a Blackmagic camera, you get the license for two computers for free with it. Uh, no. it and if you buy a lot of other Blackmagic products, I have a lot of Blackmagic gear here, so I've actually got four license keys. I'm sorry, four our four system. Key. I got each key gives you two systems, so I got I can put it on four systems because I got two keys. I got one with my speed editor keyboard, uh, mm. which lets you edit really fast, and then I got another key. Remember, one key equals two computers with my uh, Blackmagic camera, and I would like to buy another Blackmagic camera in the future as a B camera. So then I'll get another two keys, uh, another two uses if I, I do that. Have to look up what the Black cam- Black Magic camera is. I know the switch. They have the switcher. I have to look up their site. Yeah. Is it like a Pantel Zoom camera? Uh, yeah. Well, no, but uh, you could potentially put a pan tilt like mechanism sure. on it. But it, it's uh, BlackMagicDesign.com. <laughs> their cameras are on the pricier side, but you get an image out of them that is quite frankly, superior to anything I've ever seen at this price. So, you know, you're getting a really good image. 
uh, you're getting a very professional workflow with the RAW and with the ProRes. You know, this is what a lot of professional productions are shooting. And there is a professional cinema camera called the Arri Alexa that I, I am dying for. Like, I'm just saying, if anybody out there in the chat wants to send me an Arri Alexa in the mail, I'll take it. I'm just saying, just, you know, PO box on the screen now, graphic team. Uh, <laughs> you know, send it over. Obviously, no one's going to send over a camera like that, but uh, it's a great camera. And I love the image out of it, particularly the way it renders skin tones and things like that is just really natural. And it just, it looks like film. But this camera, I find, it's amazing how close it is to it. Sure, it's not built like a tank. Like the Alexa, you could probably drop it and it wouldn't break. Your lens might, but like it's metal, uh, what is it? Like carbon fiber. So it's like really tough. This camera's all plastic. You bump it the wrong way. You might as well go buy a new one probably. But yeah, probably, I didn't it's a great Black Magic, They make professional cameras as well, I guess. That's they all they. Camera. That's all yeah. they make. They, they, the word, yeah, yeah. the word consumer is not a black magic word that they've ever used. Yeah. So, for example, their cheapest cinema camera shoots 4K, and it is 1,295. So obviously, some people that's a little expensive right there. And mind you, you need a lens for that too. So that's not even your total cost. Personally, I am shooting with the Pocket 6K Pro, which is 2,535 US. So it's a little more pricey. Yeah, we went into debt on that one. That was not a cash purchase, but uh, as you probably can guess, a lot of people would have to do that. But there is places you can get them like that, and it's paid off now. But, I mean, it's a great image. You know, as they point out here, you get the Hollywood look. And, I mean, again, with the image on this camera, if we actually show you the log, this is the log image. Don't adjust your sets. This was intentional. So this is what I get in the computer to be able to grade. You get a lot of detail. Uh, this is the kind of camera that I could open my door and you could see outside and inside at the same time without having uh, the outside be blown out if I set the camera right and I put in the right NDs and everything on the lens. So, you know, again, this is really designed for somebody like me that's very technical with cameras, quite frankly, and wants the ultimate image and the ultimate control to get it. And not everybody needs that, for sure. But, I mean, if you want that, you know, I'm not a sponsor, Blackmagic, unfortunately, but go buy their stuff. But if they want to be a sponsor, give me a call. I'm just I'm just saying, folks. Um, I've called them before. They should have my number on their call logs. Just give it a call back, and we'll get that paperwork figured out, right? Because <laughs> we'll do the sponsorship. <clears throat> anyway, so, but, yeah, the, the image out of it's really good. So, you know, again, you, you, you get what you pay for with a lot of this stuff. The bit rates on these is part of the reason you get such a high quality image. I mean, again, the lowest bit rate you can get on this is ProRes Proxy, and I think it's like 80 megs a second is, is what ProRes Proxy is. Megs. 80 megs. What consumer camera shoots 80 megs a second, even at the lowest setting, right? I mean, it just... Yeah, your files are big, and that's something I don't like about it because, I mean, you get a great image, but it's... You know what yeah, I mean? It's, yeah. it's pros and cons. And, you know, so, I, I don't know. It might not be the camera for you, but I will say this. If you, it's kind of like Apple. Once you go into the ecosystem more and more, you just want to stay in the ecosystem more and more. For example, I've got their camera, I've got their switcher, and I've got their editing software. And all three integrates beautifully. And so it makes you really want to stay on platform. Because, like, for example, right now, on the switching control, I can actually do all kinds of stuff with the camera because it's able to be controlled from the switchers. You can't do that with other consumers' cameras, so. Yeah, I'm just moving and getting up here. Oh, okay. But, uh, you know, you could do a lot of control. So, like, for example, let's say that I was out of focus right now. I can press the focus button. Oh, I'm on manual focus, so it won't work. But if I switch the zoo, okay, there we go. Say, so you see that focus pull there? I just did that from my computer. I'm and, just trying to actually get on my other computer because the YouTube's really slow. Oh, okay. But yeah. yeah and... But yeah, I mean, like, the reality of it is because I can do this focus pull remotely, it makes it really easy to do a shot like this. <laughs> because I just sat down. This is what I did for the show. And I just go, okay, I'm on the computer. Hit the button. And now, just like that, we're good to go. I'm in focus. And, you know, I can control everything. My multi-view screen, I can, you know, control what's on it. So, like, for example, instead of having the multi-view up, if I wanted to just look at you full screen instead of just selling the multi-view, which is all the inputs, I could go ahead and do that. Uh, and, that, you know, it's all software switchable. Another thing, too, is if you're a developer, they've got really good APIs for a lot of stuff. Like Blackmagic Raw, there's an API for that if you want to deal with those files. There is an API for their switchers. They're, they're on the network. And so, for example, I wrote some code in Python, and I can actually auto-switch a show. <laughs> I can have a program that would switch the show like it's an operator. Granted, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of neat, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, well, and I imagine there should be software for that where when you're switching, because like I do my church service and sometimes I, I use two cameras and um, they're not the same brand, so it doesn't always look the nicest, but I'm making do with basically zero dollars, right? And, uh, I, and most people don't care if that it's uh, 100% perfect. But I mean, sometimes the speaker will walk off the shot and uh, I have to be watching all the time to make sure that they're always on shot, right? And uh, but that's kind of neat to have, like, if, if even if you could have a plugin like that for OBS to say, okay, if this shot they move, you'll go to this shot. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I mean, you know, there's you, you have the ability to do stuff like that in theory yeah. because you do have a lot of extensive API control. There actually is a way to do it with OBS too. There's a thing called OBS WebSocket that's built into the latest version now, it's open source. Maybe I should do a video about that. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but uh, the last video I did about OBS didn't do quite as well as I thought it would, so it makes me kind of. There we go. Okay. I was, I, say, I, I, I was just playing the YouTube video here and on my other computer because, like, this laptop, it's um, it's going really slow. Uh, the YouTube video is just um, uh, buffering, but it looks fine on my uh, on my desktop, I which I'm you. running a topic of this stream. Which I'm running KDE on. <laughs> there you go. There you yeah. go. Which, of course, we haven't been talking about KDE for probably 30 or 40 minutes by now. No, no. But, I, uh, yeah, I got my I got my Mint laptop here, which is like, uh, I've been using Mint, but then Mint, when they did an upgrade, there was a lot of things they did wrong. And uh, so I tried different o uh, OSs to use. And uh, so I, I tried Debian. Hey, I'll try Debian for a while. And there's a lot of things I really liked about the Debian. And I, I installed all the different environments. So I installed Mate and um, Gnome and uh, Pla uh, this Plasma. And I've been very happy with the Plasma. So I've been actually using Plasma for quite some time now over the last uh, several months. And uh, I probably will stick with it for a while. I, even if I, the one thing I did notice, it took a really long time to install Debian. Because I installed all the desktop environments. Like I asked you, do you want to have like a whole list of the environments, Mate and uh, Gnome and Classic Gnome and all these things? I said, yeah, sure, I'll collect. Oh, I'll install all those things. And so uh, at all that, it probably took most of the day. Like usually, Linux only takes an hour to install, right? Not even. Yeah. This yeah. thing took a long time to install. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I know when I tried Debian a while back, I had a lot of issues getting it installed with, like, graphics drivers and stuff sometimes, and that was something that was really frustrating with, like, an NVIDIA card. I assume it would be better with, like, an AMD or something. But, like, again... I, I'm never buying one of those again. I didn't really... See, I thought this was an Asus card, because it says Asus on it, but I guess it, it uses NVIDIA drivers. I don't understand. So, so, so companies take the NVIDIA spec. They're allowed to do this. They license it, and then they sell asus is nvidia 1080 ti for example right and and so forth so you know that that's what they do that's it's been a thing for a long time um you know that being said like you know I, i'm kind of stuck on nvidia because things like davinci resolve and a lot of the tools i use while they technically work with other stuff their performance is always the best with nvidia and it's like as we've already established i'm really a big fan of ultimate performance not ultimate not performance so you know until that nvidia uh, gets beat by Intel Arc or um, AMD on these programs like, like Blender and uh, DaVinci Resolve in particular, I'm probably not going to be moving. Like, I would love to, uh, you know, but uh, it's got to be ready for prime time, you know, for what I need, right? Like, you know, that's the thing. I think a lot of these graphics vendors like... You know, like AMD, for example, they are focusing on games. Now, Intel's, they seem to be focusing on video production. And I'm kind of tempted to get one of those because uh, they do have Ubuntu support with graphics drivers. It's like, hmm, interesting. And they're supposed to have really fast encode decode support for H.264 and 5. And while I don't shoot H.264 almost ever anymore, I do have a camera I kind of use as a roving camera that I might shoot with it occasionally or something or as a backup. But like nine times out of ten, it's ProRes or something now or like B-Raw. But regardless, oh, like, you know. You're getting over my head here a bit with what with what ProRes and B-Raw are. are. So I'm these, just using the MP4 and – well, yeah. not even H.265. I'm using uh, MPEG-4 for the most part. Yeah. Um, so what is this ProRes like? First off, like, what would be the extension of a file like that on the computer? Or well, be... so I mean, the extension. The thing about stuff like ProRes and DNX is you can have them, and this is true of a lot of other codecs too. They can be in like multiple formats, 
uh, like as far as like extension. So like you can have AMOV, you can have uh, with a ProRes, you can have an MXF if memory serves as well. Uh, these are professional wrappers like MXF mostly, media exchange format. Uh, ProRes itself, that's developed by Apple. You can use it on Linux and Mac though. Uh, I mean Linux and Windows too. Sorry, obviously you can use it on Mac. Well, Apple, Apple didn't they develop MPEG two back in the day? Like, uh, but they, I think they, they made it open. Um, no, that's that's you're thinking of something else. I'm pretty sure because the MPEG two is like the motion pictures group. That that's always been their naming convention. Okay, but unless Apple was involved in that, I I can't they, remember. They, they might they, have been. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know about that. But what I can tell you is like so ProRes. That's you know. This is a, a, a codec that's used. The Alexa, for example, remember I was talking about that camera? It shoots ProRes. Most productions that shoot on Alexa shoot ProRes. And ProRes 422HQ, for example, looks really good. It is not lossless, but it is very close, uh, at least to my eyes. And so, you know, again, if you want ultimate quality, ProRes is really good. The other thing about ProRes is you see, things like H.264, they take little pieces of each frame instead of the whole frames, and that's really hard on video editing. ProRes is designed for video production purposes, so it doesn't do that. It actually takes one frame and stores it as an entire frame, which means if, say, I want to go to frame 252 of a video, it just pulls that up instantly because it doesn't need to do all this math like an H.264 usually does. It'd be like, oh, okay, I need to take a little bit of data from here because that didn't change in the frame, and then over here in the next frame, and all... Again, it, it's a lot of computer processing, and so... You know, the files are smaller, but to me, H.264 and 5 is really better as delivery formats than they are production formats. Some productions do shoot them. Um, I, I do know, like, there is even some cinema cameras, like Canon cinema cameras will actually shoot a version of H.264 and 5. Yeah, and my Canons are all uh, dot .264, and even with 4K, it's MPEG-4. Yeah, so, you know, the codec itself is H.264, and then... You can, I think they do kind of sometimes call it MPEG-4, but the most common name I've always heard is 264. But regardless of that, like, you know, Codex well, is one of this, like, bucket world, of worms right, where... where uh, yeah. they, they, they tend to, like, I guess it was interchangeable for MPEG-4 just because of the receivers. Like, oh, you yeah. gotta get a new receiver and it'd be an MPEG-4 receiver because that's when, like, everything went from being MPEG-2, which there actually is still channels broadcasting, like, over-the-air channels broadcast an MPEG-2, this 20-year-old format where... If they use uh, H.264, for example, uh, for over-the-air broadcasts, you could fit like 20 channels on where it used to be one channel. And good, and it's just half decent quality. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know for sure about that twenty channel part, but what I can tell you is the H.264 support is actually in ATSC 1.0. It was added retroactively to the spec several oh, yeah. years ago, and some stations do broadcast in it now. But the concern is, is that if you got a TV in the first few years of the transition, from what I've been told, the, the, then it's going to be a problem. May not uh, decode it. It only does MPEG two. This is like uh, 2005 or six. Yeah, is uh, this old Samsung TV which I use as a computer monitor? Yeah, so it it, pro it probably doesn't. You know, I don't know. Like it, the the ATSC 1.0 spec is getting kind of old in the tooth. 3.0 I think will be very interesting with the better codec support that it's got. Oh and yeah, it'll work with cell phones too. That's the nice thing about it. You were that's what killed and like a lot of younger people like you don't watch over the air TV because they miss the ball with this uh, with. Uh, uh, a generation of, pe of younger people that don't even watch broadcast TV. They don't watch linear TV at all. Hey, so, Trevor's join joining us in the group. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You know, I do watch linear occasionally, um, you know, but I, I am probably the exception to the rule in that. And that being said, when I watch linear channels, they're usually like internet linear channels where it's like, yes, it is linear. It's like a 24-7, like, for example, with Paramount Plus, which is a streaming service where we can watch our local CBS affiliate linearly. 24-7. So, you know, you could watch something like that. But I've generally, you know, I'm not sticking up an antenna. We had one a few years ago, and I ended up taking it back because, you know, in my market, I would like it as a backup, but antennas are not completely free. They're not too bad. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking I might go back and get one again. But, like, there, but there's, yeah, I've had a big, like, outdoor one because around here, you have no choice. Like, you get a rabbit ear, you're not getting anything, right? I've tried them. You will not get... I am seven miles from the only two transmitters that there is in my market that I can even pick up. Like, like officially, like stuff like FCC and stuff says you can pick up other things. But I have, even with like the big antenna, spent a lot of time trying in the past to pick up stuff. And 
you know. I think, I think my laptop's crashing on me. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, you cut out for a second. I think. Oh. Can you hear me? I hear you now, and you're cutting out on me. And my laptop. Well, the battery's gotten low. I'll be right back. Uh, I'm gonna get get okay. the charger. Okay. But yeah, I'll, I'll continue with my interlude there. But uh, the thing about it is, so. There we go. Now it will switch. But the thing about it is, for me, I do, you know, not watch over the air because I don't have an antenna anymore. And like I said, we have one, but I took it back. But what I can tell you about, uh, what I can tell you about. I cut my mic instead of Robbie's, folks. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to have to start over because you all didn't get all that. My apologies for switching the wrong mic off. Uh, but what I was trying to say was I watch Linear, but we only really, in summary, get two channels here. I don't have an antenna anymore. We used to. And we only got two channels on it, which was KET, our local PBS affiliate. And they got a couple of sub channels that, uh, you know, was good. I used to watch some documentaries on PBS, for example. That was one that I would definitely want to, you know, have an antenna for as like a backup. But the most PBS affiliates in the United States, they have a live stream of their station for free. And I know mine does of all their channels. So it's like, what would be the point of me sticking up an antenna except for redundancy? Because my two channels I can get, I can get live stream to me between the Paramount Plus, what we have for the CBS field, if I want to see it. And then, uh, you know, if we didn't have that, that would be a difference. Yeah. up uh, unboxing it and plugging it in luckily we didn't lose power but it is charged and ready to go i got you yeah robbie just to clarify um th th this is by the way the bad part about being talent on your own show and also mixing the sound and the video and everything oh, is yeah. i accidentally had robbie's mic muted for a good chunk of what he just said so uh, maybe oh. maybe you might want to summarize what you just said again i did it to myself where sure, actually sure. muted me a minute well, ago uh, vincent so. did a video that. about an ups power back power backup supply a ups and i always kind of wanted one yeah yeah, yeah not, uh ups uh, power supply yep and um so anyway i i want i was trying to think what do i get my way for uh for christmas and this is what i'm i've, I've ended up getting her um and uh it's um because she's uh she's uh, on our computer a lot and so and we're all the whole family is so we want it for our router like so like because what happens typically in our area for power outage we lose our power but the internet's still working they have like backup power supplies and all that and that's something all everything works for our internet so is a uh, so we're able to uh, uh check that out and um and, and you use the ups and then, yeah we had really bad winds this week so i was we're, we're gonna might lose our power so we i it was even though it was a christmas present we plugged it in and made sure it's charged up because we might have to unwrap that christmas present and uh and uh use that at some some point before december yeah you yeah ups is like one of the best inventors ever i gotta tell you I, I was concerned whether i should get it when i bought my first one about a year ago now maybe a year and a half ago something like that i was like i don't know if i should spend this money and it was only about 50 bucks us and i'm like you know, it was kind of an impulse purchase. I seen it at Walmart. I had the money. I'm like, you know what? I've been thinking about getting one of these for a while. This is a pretty good deal. You know, I'm only going to run like my computer networking stuff off of it because I got laptops and stuff I can use. Like, you know, I just wanted to have my internet on, right? And you know what? I can get about two and a half, three hours out of one of those, you know, at least with my equipment. You know, it depends on what you're running and, you know, all those kind of things, obviously. And, 
you know, like Starlink, for example, that modem, from what I've read, is really bandwidth heavy and satellite in general is. But, like, from what I've seen, DSL and cable's not. So, like, those modems will run, from what I've seen, at least in my environment, pretty pretty decent amount of runtime on it. And I mean, for a $50 UPS, like it saved my butt so many times in work meetings and such with clients and forgetting to save code. Oh, the power blanks. Uh Oh, quickly do a get commit. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> you yeah. know, so it comes in handy. Yeah. I, well, for, for us, I'll have to plug at least three things into it because I'll have our, uh, we have a NUMA phone, an IP uh, phone, and we have our, uh, our, our modem, a cable modem, and a router. So it'll be the three things. But I think it, even with that, uh, the unit I got, it should last at least for an hour, an, a couple hours. I haven't plugged it in and tried it out. I just charged it up. By the way, Trevor, is my audio better now? Uh, I, I brought it up a little bit. Yeah, I, okay. I was, I was just, I, I was just asking about that, and I did see, you know, you probably don't need to bring it up because I had you muted, and that's what it was. They were just hearing you through my headphones, which is kind of oh, close yeah, to the mic. Yeah. But yeah, you know, your levels are pretty hot now. Now I'm gonna have to bring you down on my side, I think, because your, your okay. levels. Okay, yeah, yeah. I won't touch it anymore. I did bring it up just a little bit. No, no, that's that's okay. Let me just bring it down. All right, talk for me a little bit. Let's see if you're. All right, where it's like, uh, yeah, we're going about the uh, the ups. The yep, ups sounds good. Or, sounds ups good. Backup system. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad I got one. I'm glad we got one. Uh, it probably will end up being useful for us because, like, what happens when your power goes out? You can use your cell phone, but, like, we don't have data on our phone. So, like, we usually we'll want to find out how long our power out is going to be. Um, I'll be watching satellite TV, though, no problem. I got my uh, my satellite meters have, like, our runoff batteries. So, like, yeah. I can plug this into the satellite dish and I'm, I'm able to still watch TV, at least, you know, be entertained or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but entertainment's great. That's one reason I like podcasts, too, is because our internet does go out here, unfortunately, somewhat often. And, you know, between that and the fact we also have power just somewhat often, the, the infrastructure in East Kentucky has got a lot of reliability issues, folks. But <laughs> anyway, regardless of that, uh, we, we have a lot of storms and stuff that come through the area and things like that. We had wind today that was blowing real hard earlier, and I thought, uh-oh, we might lose power in the middle of this stream. And, uh, you know, but we haven't. We're on a UPS anyway, the switcher and everything, as far as I know. So we should be fine. But regardless, like... Yeah, there was definitely, uh, you know, you want to, I think, have, you know, be prepared for, like, a situation like that. For me, I will say this, like, one of the things you got to watch out for with, like, ISPs, I've noticed is some of them don't have battery backup. Like, my phone company, I've got cable and internet, and it seems like that the cable company's backup... They back up like their head in, like where the service comes from, but their amplifiers for some reason aren't, and the signal drops really bad to the point it won't be usable when the power's off instead of being non-existent. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind too if you're getting a UPS. For me, the DSL works fine enough when the power's out. But like, one thing that really annoys me about power companies, our power company does this too, is, hey, if you want to get updates on the outages, there's no cell signal where I live at all from any of the carriers really at all. If you're lucky, you might get one bar if you stand, you know, at the very top of the, the house and jump on the roof and do a dance and, you know, hope for the best. You might get one bar for a split second, right, to get a text or something. But you're not going to you're not going to get data this fast enough to pull up their website. And that's what they always tell you to do is like, just pull up our website and you can report an outage or you can check an outage. So they do have a phone system to do it as well. But sometimes it has issues and, you know, you have to wait. It's a more complicated process. So for me, that was one nice thing about it. Once we started to have that UPS was, you know, we've got a generator, but, you know, to report the outage, if I wanted to do it that way, I had to get the generator running. And that takes like, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And that's 15 or 20 minutes that, you know, I haven't got an outage reported, and I like to try and be like, I, I want to be one of these customers when the power goes out. You know, I check the circuit breakers, everything, and almost immediately I'm like, let's get that report in, right? You know, within maybe five minutes after the outage, you know. I don't do it absolutely instantly because one time I reported that the power was out several years ago, and it went out for maybe t five minutes, and I'd reported it over the first, like, two minutes, and then it came back and stayed on the rest of the day, and so... You know, I guess they it's probably figured call, it out. That's when it comes back quicker, but that makes it go faster too. <laughs> yeah. So, but like, you know, most of the time it's not five minutes, you know, we have several hour power to just here most of the time. Right. So, but regardless of that, I mean, you know, having entertainment, I think is really great. Again, you know, you can watch streaming stuff, you know, the way I've got it set up because we've got the UPS. And then the other thing is we got a generator so I can power the building, you know, and have everything back after a little bit. So the UPS really is, we don't really like to run the generator at night. I try to be considerate of my neighbors because it's pretty loud. And so, you know, our neighbors, a lot of them run generators when there's power outages in the middle of the night. So honestly, I don't know what I'm worried about. They must not be too concerned either. They're, they've got their own generator running. But like a lot of times we won't run them in the middle of the night. Uh, for one thing, to save fuel as well. 
I just I want eventually I want to invest in one of those. Um, they call them the solar generators, but really what they are is solar panels with a battery. You know, you can't see you can buy. Yeah, it'd be good nice to have something like that for a backup, um, especially like something that uh, if, if there's a longer power outage. I mean, I have the ideal roof for solar, solar panels. So I've always wanted to have, but more for like a back, uh, more for actually like uh, um, different uh, uses too. like uh, use the solar energy to uh, uh, help uh, with the heat in the house, <laughs> run, a, run an electric space heater off of it. I mean, it wouldn't do all of your heat, but it might help reduce the uh, the gas uh, for the furnace uh, that you, you know, yeah, save exactly. a little bit of money that way. I mean, I, I don't think it would be something that you could just, you know, it would replace all that stuff, but it would definitely, uh, with the infrastructure, putting that infrastructure, you'd have it as a backup, and then at least you'd, um, I mean, I seen the, as, I, as I was looking at those kits, but I read, I'd much rather actually just have a, 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 a built-in setup with a roof, too, just for, uh, like, having battery backups. Yeah. Because who knows, when you need it, you're going to need it. But, but most yeah. of the time, you don't need it. Because uh, the stuff, uh, all the electronics will, in your home should um, should work. At. I actually don't have a whole lot of power edges where I'm at. I'm kind of fortunate because I'm in a area. I have not had too many power edges. We, we do have the odd one, but... Yeah, it does. It's, it's few and far between, I guess. Um, yeah. My parents were out for they had a tornado in Ottawa last year and they were out for about a week. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds more in line with like outages we've had. We've had outages. Thankfully, they're relatively rare that last a week, but they have happened. And I've even heard of some people in my area that have not had power for two solid weeks before in outages. That was like they we're talking about like really bad storms where they pretty much destroyed everything. Like, thankfully, Damn. one and two week outages are pretty rare events even here. But, in a, you know, a few hours. Nice storm. Oh, yes, we've had several. In fact, actually, both yeah. of those that caused outages that lasted days. Those were the ones that really pushed that duration into the, the week. I remember the first one yeah. we had was in 2009 when I was alive here. And in 2009, we were out for a week right here where I lived. And there was people I went to school with and stuff that was out for another week. So uh, we were lucky, honestly, me and my folks, that we only had to deal with a week of it. And we had a generator, too. So, again, like I said, we were not really completely systems out for a week, right? We were, you know, we'd have to switch our generator gas and stuff every once in a while. But we could cook. We could power everything. Like, we were fine. Um, you know, but a lot of people, you know, didn't do that, you know. So that's something to keep in mind. Like, I would say anybody that wants to move here, if you ever want to move to East Kentucky... It's a beautiful place to live, you have uh, to be but, a prepper. but 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 I would t I would very much advise you to get a generator. That was something my father always really believed in was you know have a generator out here or you're nuts because you will lose so much food out here to power outages alone. It's gonna save you. I mean like uh, if you've got like we've got a deep freezer full of food, right? Cold food. Imagine a power outage of a week like that. We had neighbors that, you know, people we knew, like, that they didn't have a generator. They lost all their food in, in storms like that, right? On the other hand, we over here, we were good to go, right? You just, you know, you start that generator for a few hours every day, you're going to be fine, right? You're not going to have to worry about it. And so that right there alone will save you. Um, but for me in my studio, I would really like to actually build a solar panel around. I did the math, and it would only take a couple panels to power this building to the point that I could have everything I really needed. The biggest thing that's power users in this place is I got a space heater for heating in the winter and I've got an air conditioner for air conditioning in the summer, right? But realistically, excluding that stuff, you know, my computer is probably, my desktop is probably the next, I think it's got a 500 watt power supply and if memory serves. And you know, that's a, a, one of the bigger ones. So, but like most of the stuff in here is pretty low power. So, you know, just a, uh, you know, probably maybe a two kilowatt system, maybe a three kilowatt system would probably be enough for my building's usage most of the time. And so that would be good to save on power bills too. That's one reason I want to do it. Like what I eventually want to do is convert it to be solar a hundred percent of the time to where that the power grid is like what power grid, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like my office is just constantly on, I guess you could say not backup power, but just on its own power. Right. Because we get a lot of sun here, especially in the summertime in the winter, I would probably want to size it a little bit overkill to make sure that, you know, because we might have a day or two where that the panels are covered with snow occasionally and such like that. And, you know, so that's something I have to consider. But realistically, I think solar for me in the long term is really going to be where it's at. Like the UPS isn't the generator. To me, those are short term fixes to, you know, what I could do better with in the long term. 
I mean, so it'd be a fun thing to do with uh, YouTube videos too, just to make it tutorials on how to. I, I mean, there's people doing that uh, on YouTube as well, where uh, uh, they build their um, their power backups. Um, I know uh, Eric over at Far Far Point Farms. He has all that set up, where he has a solar uh, setup for enough, I guess, to keep things going, but not enough maybe to run his whole house. But usually, with a system like that, it's not going to run everything. But at least if it run keeps your refrigerator and. Uh, if you have if you're able to burn wood as a backup or anything like that uh it's kind of nice to have that um alternative alternative source for energy but uh yeah for me it's like uh it's just a matter of having the uh the funds to uh invest in that yeah that, that, that see, that's for a lot of people. and see that's that's the way that's where i am it's like you know building up the studio there's been so many things i need to invest in uh me and my mom have been building this thing up and it's like you know, it just never makes the chop of the shopping list to get solar panels. Like, I, I want to do it, but, like, you know, it works good enough the way it is for now, right? But, yeah, I think long-term would be good. And there's a lot of cool stuff I might do around solar panels. I might do a video or two about them uh, at some point. Because one thing I would really love to do is I've got an equipment rack in here, and I want to back up that. I want That would be interesting to maybe the open source people in here, like servers and stuff. And back up my Raspberry Pi, that's one thing I thought would be cool to do with a, a solar panel. There's kits out there to do that. But another thing on solar is there are solar charge controllers that I've seen where you can hook them up to a computer. I think it'd be really cool to build some software for a Raspberry Pi, hook it up to that solar charge controller, and then you could make your own like Tesla wall kind of a thing where you could monitor your charge amount and how much your panels are producing. Because I would like to be able to graph things like that. So I'd be like, okay, I know right now that it, let's say I set it up in the summertime, you know, we get more sunlight in the summer, obviously, right? Because you know you you have a later sunset. Okay, well, I can already see right now with my usage pattern and having four panels let's say or three panels i might want to add an additional one or two panels and maybe another battery for the winter months you know before that happens right so stuff like that could be good or if let's say i add more equipment to the studio in the future because i probably will at some point right then i would want to look and see oh okay that's using more power now we might want to add another panel you know what i mean so like there's there's more i guess maintenance to it than that yeah it's definitely something if you do get into it you're you're um it, there's a lot of upkeep to it, I guess. Like it's, uh, but if you're the type uh, do do it yourself or and that's you enjoy that sort of thing, it would be it's definitely awesome. To yeah, play around with it. And, and and I'm that kind of type, right? I'm like this nerdy kind of guy that's like, oh, let's you know, let's build our own stuff. You know, it's part of the reason I like to be software development, right? Is you get to you get to build your own stuff. Uh, but I mean, that being said, yeah, solar, I think. You know, I, I've been interested in solar for a long time, and I think that if, if I think a lot of our viewers probably would be the kind of types, Ravi, that would be into it. I I, I could gather that kind of looking oh, at yeah, the people sure. that are there. A lot of them would probably be like, "Yeah, let's you know set it up." But you know, I, I think it's you know it's good for the environment. It's good for your pocketbook too, right? I mean, I don't know about where you live, but where we live, me and my mom, the power is pretty expensive here, and so you know, like especially you know if you have got you know, like we have electric heating, for example, that adds up. Uh, obviously, that hurts the bill. But like, even if you was to not have electric heating, we know people that don't use electric heating much. The bills here are still, in my mind, pretty, in, you know, in, intense. You know, and so Somebody I think being to able to adjust a generator them. that runs on water. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and it converts it into hydrogen, and uh, and basically that would be perfect. It would put all the power companies out of business because that, that that would be like the best idea ever. Because in East Kentucky, we get so much flooding here in the summer. Oh my goodness, you just set up a you know a big enough water reservoir on your property, and you'd have power for months. That would be awesome. That's our that, that's our water. that's our problem to the to solve the flooding situation. Everybody in East Kentucky. You know, people talk about how we're going to deal with that, supposedly, right? There's your solution. Build a generator, and let's just use it to make power. Now we have a use for all that floodwaters, right? You know, and so we do have... Well, one thing I wanted to go back to uh, KDE talk here. Uh, when yeah. you uh, went to a terminal, um, you couldn't find the terminal because uh, when K-Console, I had with yeah. my installation, my installation had like three of them. Yeah, so I didn't uh, find... XFCE? Yeah. console and make terminal i have like three different terminals in this uh, computer yeah 
the, the reason you're probably going to have multiple like that is normally when you install like Mate, it installs the Mate terminal, XFC, etc. Okay, yeah. uh, that being said, on mine, it did not install the, the K console, which is from what I understand, at least it used to be the default terminal uh, emulator for you know a KDE system. I assume it still is, and it's just not was not installed for whatever the reason. I could probably like do like a manual install of it, right? But uh, like an apt install, it's probably like apt install K console or something. You know, it was probably the command in like Debian or Ubuntu. So you know th that would be an interesting idea. But yeah, I mean like as far as Debian goes and uh, and KDE, I gotta say personally, it doesn't seem too bad to me. But it's just. You know, I always come back to this every time I try KD. I've tried it several times. It's just, it just doesn't really mesh with me. You know what I mean? Like, they built it for a user that's looking for different things. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I, yeah, I, I, you know what? And I think it's probably one that would fit me more. I'll probably continue to use, um, uh, even if I go to Ubuntu, I would probably uh, install KDE along with it. I and mean, things would probably work about well uh, with that. Um, uh, especially uh, for a lot of the software that I want to use. And um, so if I do reinstall this computer here, I may go Ubuntu and just install and then run K KDE uh, as the interface, as my primary interface. Um, but I think uh, right now I have things working decently, but I, that's what I might do next just to try out Ubuntu again under KDE. Yeah, and I mean, you know, th there's a distro of Ubuntu that comes with KDE pre-installed. I actually tried that, and it it seemed pretty nice. Uh, I tried it maybe about a month and a half ago, something like that. And it seems like, oh, you know, Kubuntu? it was a pretty good one. Kubuntu, thank you. That's exactly the one I was thinking yeah. of. I couldn't remember the name. Yeah. I'm thinking, like, you know, it's like one it's of those popular ones. It's been around for a ones. long time. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the popular It's been around for a long time. Like, I, I think I used that back when I first started using Ubuntu. And, um, yeah, I... I, I, I should probably that, that's probably what I'm gonna try next uh, just to you know get get back into that uh, um, OS because uh, I, I think uh, I like things that w because Ubuntu is so well supported for everything uh, it's it's definitely a good way to go like I don't want to go into something that's really you know I don't want to mess around too much with the system I just like to, I like using Linux I like the free software and, yeah, I, and exactly. I know how to use a lot of software now yeah exactly I mean you know like the free the free software aspect, I think a lot of people use Linux for that. I do like the open source aspect, but I'm not per se like as big of an open source person as a lot of people are, right? Like as far as I'm concerned, if it's proprietary and it does what I need, I'm okay with that. But you know, not everybody is, and that's fine. But I will say it's, to point out one of the things I love about Linux, I, a video I did about that recently is for some reason doing really good. But that video, uh, hello, hello, one of Robbie's kids is uh, saying hi to us from the looks of it. Yeah, she's uh, she's showing us her her, uh, her remote control dog. Oh, okay. Does your dog have a name? Bark. What's the dog's name? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Oh, there it's you go. At you, there you go. No, that's gonna get my dogs barking uh, in just a second. We'll probably have we'll probably have them barking in the background. So uh, there you go. They'll be talking over the Discord call here. <laughs> Actually, she can't hear you. I'm wearing headphones here, so. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. That makes sense. I didn't know if it would back or not. But. Oh, yeah. So, but anyway, um, as far as, like, KDE goes, let me switch my camera angles here. But, yeah, no, as far as, like, KDE goes, you know, like, for me, I think that I'm not going to probably go anywhere. But one of the things I really like about Linux is the fact that you have choice. And so, you know, me and you both can be using Ubuntu, for example. And I prefer GNOME, and I can have GNOME, and you can have KDE. And we can have the same underlying system, just a different way of interacting with it, right? Like, that's, to me, a very powerful feature of Linux, right? Is You know, you do have a lot of that choice. So th that's actually something I really like to do, too, is actually play with, like, different software on Linux, right? Like, different desktop environments. I think a lot of us do that, Uh you know, as far as like desktops go, and uh, so would you say KDE? I guess I'll interview you now, Ravi. Uh, <laughs> welcome to your unscheduled interview. Uh, what do you yeah. think about KDE from a standpoint of usability? Are you the kind of guy? I know you said you like it, but it, would you say it's like your favorite desktop from a usability standpoint for you, or is there still somebody I else like that you like better? I really liked how Mint worked before they, did it. they went and messed it all up, but. Uh, uh, I, I kind of like it. Well, it has like the launch bar. You can put it wherever you want, like at the bottom, which I like. And uh, so the environment itself is um, um, 
definitely one that I, it's like probably my second favorite next to mint like i wish i can get the desktop environment that mint used like from like five years ago and put that on like the new ubuntu i got and you. just work yeah and just have all the new updates and features that work properly with it there, there may be a way to do that. Uh, I mean, I know you can get sentiment on it. You, maybe, you, maybe somebody will fork it and make the old version available or something. I, you know, like. But I, as far as cinnamon goes, the desktop environment. I'm assuming that's what you were using with Mint, right? Was it the cinnamon desktop distribution? Cinnamon or Mate, one of the two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know it's hey, like you know, you can definitely do that. You know, one of the things I really didn't care much for actually about Linux Mint was the fact that the, I like Mate like more stock, and they kind of customize it. You know, but again. Uh, the nice thing about Linux is you can always undo the customizations or do your own customizations. And so that that's really, to me, one of the biggest selling points about Linux is just the amount of control the user has, right? I mean, you know, you can get the desktop the exact way you want it. Like, for example, the biggest thing I have with KDE as an issue for me is honestly the fact that I am not a big fan of the default theming. But again... You can get your own themes for the mouse cursor, for the windows, right? Just like you can another desktop. So, you know, you do have some options there. And I think that's, you know, a pretty good thing about it. Um, and another thing about KDE, I guess, that comes to mind for me is, I say a lot of people probably really like the fact that KDE's got this suite of, like, all this great software, right? Is that something that really kind of pulled you to KDE? It's like, oh, look at all these, you know, designed to work clearly perfect with KDE programs that are in the KDE suite well, of applications. The thing that made KDE, I think, work for me, so when I installed Debian on this system, it had I installed everything, right? And I tried everything. I had the classic, uh, classic um, G GNOME uh, setup, which I really liked that. But then when I was like doing the, um, uh, using it for uh, with Caden Life uh, for the for the most part, I really started liking this uh, this uh, desktop environment again. Something I did use years ago. But then I customized it too, eh? Because at first, like. Uh, the panel was way too big, like it was huge, and so I shrunk that down a bit, did a little, you know, a little tweaks to it, and uh, I was actually very happy to it with it once I did a uh, got some tweaks done to it. Yeah, I mean, like tweaking it to taste, I think is a really good idea, and uh, you know, for me, I personally can't really argue with that. Like that's something I like about Linux is the fact you can tweak it, and I, I think most people probably tweak their desktop environment of choice to taste a little bit. I know, for example, uh, I used to add a few small extensions to the GNOME desktop because you know, it was close to what I wanted, but I wanted it to be a little different. And so, you know, that's the nice thing. You can obviously add extensions and applets and, you know, whatever the thing wants to call it, right, to show the weather or the time differently or whatever it is. So, yeah, I mean, I think everybody customizes. For me, I try to customize minimally because I don't want to spend you know, like six months after I reinstall something, oh, I want to get this extension and this extension and this extension. Now I have to go in and configure this extension, right? Like, you know, and it also seems to, at least with GNOME, the more extensions you have, the more it's bogged down. So like, I usually yeah. ran it pretty light, like like one or two extensions. There were settings I had on my old system, and this is like over 10 years ago, where, I don't know if you remember the, um, where it would fold it up, fold up your windows as an airplane and fly into the fly back in and just do a little graphical things like that. Uh, I never really bother with that anymore anyway, because like it's, it's not really worth the time and effort. But I remember having that in, uh, I think it was in, uh, yeah, it was in Ubuntu and uh, in my Ubuntu years. And it had all these cool features where it would fold up the windows and close up, you know, and just little graphical things. But who really cares about that kind of stuff, really? But for the for when it comes to like the whole desktop environment uh, but it was kind of nice to have that the best os that i really that i was kind of a fan of was they had this commodore os and i used to actually use that as my main operating system for on a laptop for a short while and it had like uh you know it was um just had a re really retro font theme um to it like it felt like you're on an old computer with a modern desktop and i thought that was kind of a uh, that was kind of a cool feel, and I kind of get that with uh, with uh, the KDE interface. It feels like kind of the old school computer interface, which I kind of like. I got you. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. you know, like th that's the thing. One of the things I like about Linux is that you don't have to have something that looks like it's Windows. I'm going to move my camera over, and I'm going to move over a little bit here because the sun is shining right on me, and I'm getting tired. Of I'm trying to adjust the exposure of the camera back and forth to not overexpose me. And yeah, so I'm just gonna do that. But uh, let's see if it cooperates. If I hey, come over here, your Christmas lights up. Huh? Yeah, I do. Yeah, your Christmas. 
Yeah, so it, it's still a work in progress to get this thing decorated. Uh, but yeah, it, I'm working on it. By the way, speaking of decorations, what do you think about uh, the couch here? I'll get out of the frame and everybody can look at it for a minute and just see. This is what a couch looks like, everybody. I'm sure you already knew that, but it's actually a love seat, I guess, technically. But uh, this was a Christmas gift from my mom. And I gotta say, I'm very happy with it. Uh, so now, now if I have a guest to come over, like my friend Billy, we can do a show right here, and, and I can, you know, have both of us on camera really easy. And you know, it's very comfortable too. I mean, I've been sitting on it for a while, and it just, it doesn't really bother me. So, uh, you know, like compared to the office chairs I've got in here, which are pretty uncomfortable, quite frankly, these are like a lot better, right, from a comfortability standpoint. Yeah. If that makes any sense. I got a sectional couch over here. I actually probably can see the part of the sectional behind me because my kids have been taking apart the sectional. Uh oh. <laughs> and I'm in big bird sitting on it right now. If you can see him. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that. Yeah. So okay. that's. And, uh, but it's kind of neat with the sectionals too. They break, uh, they break apart into different sections where you can have a love seat. You can do different things with it. Another thing you can do with a, a sectional is you can move it and like make it into a bed, like put the pieces together and make a bed out of it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I looked at a futon and it actually had, um, it actually had like the ability to like to turn into a bed, for example, right? And I thought that was kind of a, an interesting, I guess you could say, idea. Um, I've had people tell me, why don't you just put a bed up in here? Because this is several hundred feet away from our house. So like, you know, if I'm up here working late at night, I spend a lot of hours up here anyway, then you can make the argument, well, why don't you just stay up there? <laughs> right? You know, just take your nap up there or whatever. I could. You know, but I'd rather, you know, go back to the house, you know, home is uh, you have, you have insulation in there or is it, uh, is that, uh, the, the outside wall behind you or this is the outside wall. So there's insulation in a, in part of it. I don't really have an easy way of showing you, but there's insulation over on this wall on the opposite side of, of, of the room here, uh, part of it. But like, yeah, the, the building is not completely insulated. That's one of those things. Speaking of like priorities to be invested in is, you know, as we're heading into winter, yeah, we're gonna want some better insulation in here. Like the, the the heater actually, okay, the heater actually works pretty good in here, but uh, you know when we get like really cold winter days, uh, which thankfully don't happen quite as often here as they could, I suppose, then that could be you know somewhat of an issue to deal with, um, you know, to deal with the cold. But it hasn't really been as much of a problem this year. We've been, actually had a relatively warm. I guess it's technically still fall, but like we've had some cold weather here and there, but it's, we've had a lot more warm. Like, like right now it's like 60 something, I think degrees today. I don't know what that is in Celsius for the Celsius viewers, but, uh, which is probably most of the audience considering the U S is kind of the exception to the rule on that. But, uh, yeah, like that's the thing that, uh, you know, that's one thing I do want to work on on this specific facility is actually getting the the heating cost to probably be a little lower because right now to keep it warm, like on a cold night, for example, you have to run the heater pretty, pretty hard. And even then it's still kind of comfortable enough to stand if you need to work up here, but not perfect. Uh, yeah, but no, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice building. I really do like it. I just need to get, you know, it's like a work in progress, right? It's, it's my, um, what, what's it called? Um, I can't think of what it's called. Like it's, it's my project, I guess you could say. Right? It's your man cave. Yeah. It's, it's, it's my man cave. It's my work in progress you know, facility, right? Where it's like, you know, I'm trying to build it up. And so far, I think it's done, you know, pretty good. I mean, I've had it for a little over a year. We got it in October of last year, October 15th of last year it was delivered. So, uh, you know, we've had it since then. And I think it's, you know, we've gotten pretty good. We got internet up here. We've got, uh, you know, my audio board up here. We've got pretty much everything up here. I need to do what I need. It's really just making it look pretty at this point, right? That's where we're at. So... That, that's where we're at is just getting it to look, you know, a little better, you know, because I mean, like right now, if you look at my walls, this doesn't really look quite as professional as I would like it to look. Um, but, you know, budget does not allow to just instantly do this. And one of the things I want to do, I do want to finish this and make it look like a, you know, office or a house would look, you know, with like finished walls. But before I do that, I obviously want to run electric in it. I want to run insulation in it, things like that. And so, you know, for the time being, I'm not going to be, you know, finishing the walls up. Um and I'm also not the handiest guy in the world either. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat handy, but like realistically certain things like insulation stuff, I know really nothing about pretty much at all. So like, you know, getting some advice on it from people and trying to, you know, get some assistance on it is going to be necessary too. So that obviously complicates timelines. 
<clears throat> let's look at the chat here real quick and see if there's anything in the chat. I see Trevor here says, here where we are, we use, our power company uses hydroelectric uh, generation. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think hydroelectric is a great power generation option. Um, I would like to see more of it be used here. I, I, as far as I know, I don't really think we have that much at all of hydroelectric here in East Kentucky. Um, so that would be something I would like to see some more of is, is some hydroelectric generation. Uh, just touching on open shot here for a minute, kind of jumping around like the um, ADHD person that I am. If we look here at the release notes for um, for open shot, I don't have an easy way of showing it on the screen right now, but I'm looking here because the computer I normally do it with, I've got uh, Robbie on. But what I am seeing is like there's a bunch of improvements they've done to it from the looks of it um, just in the last release. So it's possible that they've actually got some some better support than they used to. Let's look at the features here. What have they got that would really, I mean, they've got the 3D titles. They had that before. I'm trying to see like what stuff in this is actually new. None of the stuff to me looks that different in like the list of things. So there, there may be some new stuff. I mean, I used to actually edit some stuff in OpenShot, so it's not too bad. But, you know, it definitely, I think, is compared to DaVinci, for example, a lot more learning. But, you know, again, like we were talking about earlier for that viewer, I think for somebody that just needs something simple, it probably is, it's probably all you need, if that makes any sense, right? You don't need to go, don't need to go too overboard. So... I don't know if Robbie's coming back or not. Are you, are you coming back, Robbie? Uh, yeah, I'm down here, so I just uh, helping them get things uh, uh, entertained. I, they got the home videos on the projector going right, right now, so they can see like kind of the. There's our projector in the background there. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, that's kind of nice. I, they're not that expensive now. I, I so it's kind of fun. They're, it's not the greatest quality projector that I got. But it, uh, I mean, the kids like it. Like when I was a kid, I would have been happy with that. I had a film projector, you know, an eight millimeter yeah. film projector, watched our home movies, and I thought that was just great. And so, so, it's, so, it's, so at least they could enjoy that. And... Yeah, that's how you're gonna get stuff. Yeah, and I, I think the the quality that you can get out of um, the quality you can get out of like a, even a decent projector today is probably good enough for most people. Um, you know, I, I, looked, I was looking at some Walmart uh, projectors for like a hundred yeah. bucks, and they could do 1080p and you know up to 60 frames per second video. And I'm thinking, you know, they probably aren't the best projectors in the world by any stretch of the definition. But I think for a lot of people, it would probably be good enough. Like one idea I thought would be pretty cool to do, uh, maybe next summer, is to have like put a projector up in the front yard and like do like as I'm tr I'm working on a feature film and I want to do another one. It's like having like screenings of the stuff I work on, like. For like people that want to come and watch it with me, you know, we could like have like food, like kind of throw like a a rap party kind of a thing. It's like, hey, you can watch the movie, we can hang out, we can eat, you know what I mean? And just like have like a projector that just like that's relatively affordable for that. Actually, I've seen the blow up screens on Amazon, so I don't know how good they are, but I've seen them on Amazon. Yeah, and I I was actually thinking about getting one of those like on Amazon, like you were talking about there, because again, they they don't seem too expensive for the price, but that's one question I wonder too. Is like, what is the quality that you're getting for that? You know, are you getting what you pay for? Which you know might yeah, not be. Well, one, one thing I, I tried it was like twenty bucks, and it was like a silver screen sheet, and you hang it up on the wall. And I thought it would work better, but it was so wrinkly, and it's polyester, so you're not supposed to iron it. So, I, uh, and they had all these videos of how you get the wrinkles out of these because it comes in like a little bag, right? It's like ten feet, but it's like in a little bag, and when you open it up, it's all creased. It looks awful, and I actually have uh, my 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 walls as you can see are brown, but it actually the projector works decently on that. If there is anything, I would paint this wall here. Uh, I would paint it uh, like uh, with the screen color, you know, the white color, um, to uh, make the projector work better. But I think it works fine right now. Maybe sometime I will eventually change it. At one point, I wanted to paint it green. Just so I had a big green screen on my wall. Uh, it, uh, using OBS is a lot of fun. When you hook a camera up, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with that. Yeah, I mean, gr green screen is an interesting idea. That's one idea that I've had to try and... I've got a green screen. I eventually want to set it up, but I need better lighting in here for one thing. But 
Uh, and it's kind of a small space, too, so it's kind of hard to get away from the green screen. But I, I'd like to play with it. One thing that's really cool about the ATEM switchers, and again, I, I this is not sponsored by Black Magic, but they really should. They they should just get on the line. They know? should be getting you get, you're giving them so I, much. I, 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 I tell you, I, 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 I'm friends of a broadcast engineer, uh, a few of them, and some of them have dealt with the ATEMs, and they don't they don't care for them, their switchers. But I got to tell you personally. They work good for me. Knock on wood. Watch the stream go out in about three seconds because the switcher crashes. Never mind. Anyway, ping and changed. But no, uh, so far, so good. And uh, one of the things that their switchers can do that I played with a little bit, I haven't done it on like the air, like live, but just playing with it off the air, is you can do chroma key, like real-time chroma key, with the switcher. In fact, you can do up to four chroma keys at once with the model that I have. Not that I really could see you would need to do four different keys at the same time. I guess there's probably some use case, but... I, I don't need it, but, um, you know, you can do it. And, you know, so th the switchers are pretty nice. It's actually streaming it right now. I'm using the A10 Mini at stream for anybody that's wondering what model switcher I'm using. And uh, using the hardware encoder on it, it can encode the uh, recording to an SSD plugged into it over USB, and it can also stream live as well. And on the multi-view, one of the things that's really great about the live streaming built in oh, yeah. is used to when I was live streaming, I wasn't having a good way to check the status of the stream. It actually shows me in one of the multi view panels the bit rate of the stream and if YouTube's reporting any problems back to the encoder. And so I love that because now I, I don't have to worry, oh, am I off the air? <laughs> like right now I can see, yep, we're going at about 4.6 megs a second up and YouTube is happy. So, uh, you know, and if it has any issues, it blinks this big red text, ah, warning, warning, you know, something's wrong. So, then I'll know my internet's went out or something and I can stop talking to the camera because you can't see it anyway. So do you have cable or fiber or DSL where you're at? So so what I've got, I've got Doxus cable uh, for the actual stream. That's what we're going over right now. And that's really our main connection. And then we've also got DSL as a backup here, bonded DSL. The bonded DSL is not really fast enough to live stream over. I get about a meg and a half up, maybe two megs up on a really good day on it. And then I get about 40 megs down. So the download's not too bad. The upload's really where you're you you know you're losing on it. But for a live stream, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, that being said, though, there is fiber, supposedly, my telco that provides the DSL. Supposedly, they're rolling out fiber up through here. I don't know. I heard recently that supposedly they'd actually roll it up through my Pacific part of town. I know some people on the other side of town that's got that's like been able to get it, and they say it's really good. So like, who knows? Maybe I'll be able to do this stream over fiber. But realistically, the fiber is pretty expensive, unfortunately, and the, the the cable internet is really dirt cheap. I mean, we're paying fifty something dollars a month for a hundred meg by twenty service. That's not really, in my mind, that expensive, right? And it, it does what I need, right? I'm really the only person. My mom gets on the internet and she'll browse Facebook or something or shop. You know, occasionally she'll watch something on Netflix or Hulu. And, you know, for me, you know, I'm pushing up code. I'm doing, watching YouTube and stuff. For what I'm doing, I just don't really see a need to go higher in than we've got for now. Like, pushing up video files for archive is the only, and, and live video and stuff like that, is the only thing I would love to have even more bandwidth for. So I could do multiple live streams and have plenty of overhead for, like, a Discord call. For example, maybe in the future if I get big enough uh, to have, like, the need to do that. Yeah, you know, like one thing we were talking about, Robbie, I, I, if you remember this, I was actually watching, the other day I went back and looked at, you remember the New Year's live stream you were on? We were talking about OB server and OB player and doing like a linear like Linux channel. Remember that? I would love to actually oh, still do that. And if we do that, like I'd probably just encode it from here. Um, but, you know, that's the thing. Like if you're encoding a bunch of streams like that, it starts to add up how much you can get away with. Like I think six megs a second for 720 is fine. And for example, and that's probably what I would just do it in, honestly, for anybody that's wondering for that channel, because it would be up 24 seven and I don't want it to eat up too much of my bandwidth if I'm encoding it. I just think the problem with that too is just finding the content to, to run. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, it's, it'd be great to have it. Uh, it'd be uh, fun to, to work on that and, um, and have a project like that on the go. But it, yeah, just having the content to go. Uh, I mean, you can always reach out to other uh, video creators and uh, see if they'd be interested in uh, airing their content on that, on that platform. Yeah, and I mean, I think that would be interesting. One of the concerns I have is that, you know, everything that I do, I put it under my LLC. So it's really a business operation. So one thing that would be a concern about that is, uh, you know, I don't want anything to reflect bad on my business. Right, because I mean, it's making me money as a software developer, and so you know, I don't want people to say, "Oh, well, somebody on your Linux, you know, linear channel said something really bad." For example, right? Like, so I would want to have pretty lockdown moderation. So I would be selective about who I would let 
go on air. Like you, for example, I'd be like, sure, air your stuff. Like nothing that you, you know, have done, at least that I've seen would be like something I would be concerned about. But, you know, like some of the, you know, people on YouTube, right? Not just, you know, Linux people, but just in general, like you'd have to be careful because some of them, they say some pretty outlandish crap, right? I, I don't think it, that's the most controversial thing to say that people on YouTube say random crap that, you know, you might not want to be like rebroadcasting, right? Some of it. So, you know, that, that would be the thing I would be wanting to keep detailed filtration. You know, again, it really would just be, especially at the beginning, I would be like, you know, you'd have to be like very trusted, right? Because I wouldn't probably have the time to, to vet it. Like somebody like you, I would just give you the ability just to push it out to the feed without even needing me to look at it first. Right. But I eventually what I'd want to do is go in and say, okay, we need to actually look at what's, you know, being uploaded and make sure, like, have somebody watch it and say, this is okay, right? And, and or this isn't okay, you know. For example, one thing I do is I try to keep it family friendly. So, no swearing, you know, there's certain topics that, you know, you don't want to have in a family friendly show. So, it's like, okay, you know, if one of those things come up, you know what I mean? Uh, I would want that not to, you know, be broadcast. Uh, also, uh, I'm not hearing your audio. You might have muted, but I uh, forgot about it. But I, did yeah, I had a, um, my kids and their friends come here for a second, and uh, uh, friends just showed up here. To, I didn't realize we we're coming to the house today. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, no worries. But yeah, I seen you talking, so I assumed you were talking to the the show, and I'm thinking, oh, is, is he muted on my end? And nope, he wasn't. So, but yeah, no, I think that that you know again would be a good idea, and that's something I've considered is like reaching out to people and trying to do that. Uh, again, the real problem is content moderation, if you ask me, and also the fact that. I need to get all the infrastructure put together and it's just, I don't really have the time, but I think in the future it would be an interesting project where maybe, you know, we get a bunch of the Linux YouTubers together and we would do something and it doesn't have to just be Linux. It could be other things too, but I think like a, I think a linear kind of thing would be pretty cool. Um, who knows? Maybe, 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 one, maybe what we ought to do, Robbie, considering you're the satellite guy, what we ought to do is all of the Linux YouTubers, we get together and like form like a coalition of some kind where we can like have a satellite feed of all of our Linux programming. Yeah, yeah. that would that would yeah. be pretty cool, right? Like have like a transponder. Yeah, that would be that. Yeah, just got to raise the five thousand dollars a month to have the feed. That's or, right. Patreon.com. Well, <laughs> yeah, Patreon.com or something. Yeah, um, where the feed would be like uh, five thousand for probably the. Qual a little bit better quality than this camera here, uh, or twenty thousand to thirty thousand if you want really good HD quality. Like that's pretty much where it's at for yeah. that sort of thing. Um, but also, a lot of channels are using H.265 as a delivery, uh, so that's becoming more uh, common now. So that's uh, so yeah for a satellite channel. Yeah, uh, for a twenty-four-seven channel. Yeah, I mean, you're more of the satellite guy than I am, but you know, like from what I gather, I think it would probably be okay. Considering to use H.265, I, I get that not every decoder is gonna, every box is gonna have it. But what kind of what I'm thinking is, if that we had say a channel like that, Linux users, I'm gonna guess most of them are nerds, and they're probably gonna be running a box that's relatively a, recent. Yeah, they're and, gonna have something that most of the, for the Linux channel, you're gonna figure out how to get make H.265 work. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know. I wouldn't be surprised at all, like, you know, there's probably, um, you probably know about this, there's probably, like, some kind of card you can get for your PC for dirt cheap on Linux where you could, uh, you know, like, decode it that way, you know? Like, so, again, the kind of audience we're dealing with here, I could see a lot of them saying, well, you know what, I'll just set up my own dish and set up my own little tuner and broadcast it throughout the house over, like, the computer network. You know, I could see people doing that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's doable. Um, although the Linux, oh, that's one thing with the the tuner that I have. Um, for it to work in Linux is a bit of a pain. Um, I do have a, but it's actually where the receiver works as a front, uh, what is that, a front end, I guess, or is it, I don't know. The receiver actually will distribute it over the network. So yeah. then you could just watch it on any device. That's pretty much how I do it. There is a device that does it, but it's. The software for it works much better in, under Windows, and, and no one's ever, I guess, made, wrote a program in Linux for it to make it work just as well in Linux as it does yeah. in Windows. So that's one thing where, um, and it's just the, the support for that. And it's also such a niche technology yeah. that, uh, yeah. And now, Linux, really hardcore Linux people, there's software that they can make work for it. It's just I was playing around with it, and I had a hard time even getting it working for for. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you, that, you can have a Windows machine for that task or something, right? People could do that. I will say this, as far as I'm concerned, like, I think what would be really cool is to have something like the HD Home Run that does generate the feed and gives us an API so we could build our own program for Linux if it, one doesn't exist. I think that would be great. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that their streams, they're probably HLS or MPEG Dash. That is very easy to play as a software developer that doesn't take a lot of code to do that in most programming languages so i'm just saying like you know gstreamer will play both of those for example so in linux most distro ship gstreamer you you hack you know you, you hack into gstreamer as the software developer right and you know you just tell it play the stream and you're done right and and so that it could be literally as simple as that just you know talking to gstreamer and say here it is right decode this for me and show it on the screen here so like it could be as simple as doing that if they would just if we knew what the feed links was you know that it's generated kind of a thing and so that, that could be an interesting idea you know if i ever got into this that would be something i would probably do is like try to figure out like what is the the actual feeds that it's generating like the network feeds maybe i could you know build a program myself yeah. you know that, again I, I, i'm not i'm not i'm not opposed to building an open source app for people to do that if i have the time yeah, well, that's always in my back of my mind, a project like that. It's, uh, yeah, right now it's like uh, with uh, three young children, though. The, I, I think the main, the big obstacle, I guess, is doing all the, um, setting up all the programming and schedule, like the whole scheduling part. <laughs> that would be like a big, uh, big issue. Yeah, I mean, you know, that that's the thing. I mean, yeah, you would be doing scheduling. What I was thinking, and one of the reasons I wanted to use OE Server, and full disclosure, I'm a contractor for Broadcast Rank, the company that builds it just so everybody knows like yeah i don't want anybody to think like oh you know that's that i'm just trying to sell it i, I do like it but it, you know it's not perfect may not be right for you anyway regardless one of the things i do like about it is you can do very good scheduling with it and it's not too much of a pain uh so one thing i could do for example let's say somebody like you i trust i can give you what's called a time slot in the schedule where it's like you can put anything you want in and then then it just comes down to you having time to upload your, let's say, your one-hour show's content and then just quickly drop it in there and hit save. You know, so that if we could get everybody to the point where they were trustworthy enough that we don't have to vet them, you know what I mean? And you could just give everybody, you know, you get your two-hour time slot a day or whatever it is to fill, and then they can put whatever they think is good there, then that would probably be a relatively easy thing to do. But the problem is, is that, again, I think realistically, we're going to get to a size that we're going to not be able to vet everybody. It's just going to happen. Uh, no, yeah. you know, maybe at the beginning we could do it, but I think there's going to be a certain point where it's like, okay, you know, we're either going to have to like have somebody that's like paid to sit there and like vet everything. Right. Or we're going to have to like have like the same, like 10 people do like everything. Right. And I mean, you know, I wouldn't be opposed for them, like people like running like their YouTube videos. So like, you know, you don't have to like maybe make stuff that's bespoke for like the channel as far as I'm concerned. Like as long as it's you know, Linux, right? Obviously, you don't want to be sitting there talking about, you know, like sports on the Linux linear channel. <laughs> right? No, no, no. Well, I, I think because of that, like, there's like a certain level of, um, I think there's a need for uh, basically like everyone that watches our audience. I think there's like a need for that retro technology would fit in there and future technology and, and, and computers and all that. I, I think there's. Uh, uh, I mean, that that would be something I would probably have in my favorites list if there was a channel like that. So. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we could always encode it to like a YouTube channel, like for example, for the feeds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it. a real easy. Yep. And yeah, the other that, thing, that, 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 nothing to do. Yep. Yeah. The other thing about doing to, to YouTube too is the fact that YouTube has got apps on almost every smart TV platform. So if you do want to watch it, the linear channel on your TV, you know, it's easy to do it. With, say a Roku box, an Apple TV. I think has got YouTube on it now. I don't know. Like they're on a bunch of stuff, but I know they're on Roku, for example, and that's the number one set-top box in North America. The last time I checked, so that right there alone, hey, that's a good audience right there just to get them. Bunch of them's got to be nerds, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Roku's are like uh, it's what I recommend to people. Like I don't get any money to recommend Roku. But, uh, like, for my family, who are not tech-savvy, I do all their tech support. Um, I recommend the Roku because it's uh, it'll, it will just have, like, what they would want, right? And they can get at it fairly easily. Um, and my our TV is a Roku. I made sure I bought a Roku. The neat thing with projectors, I, I've noticed, RCA has a few. They had them at Walmart. I don't know if they have them now. But they actually have the Roku. It's basically like the Roku TVs where they have Roku built into it. So at least this projector would be able to basically be like a Roku smart TV and you just project it on the wall. So that's uh, 
that's kind of a neat um a neat feature a neat, a neat feature to have like, yeah. uh, because this projector here it does have youtube um oh yeah youtube did not like um oh, my son was watching blippy on it and it, it it said this is not a licensed device on the top of the screen so like there'd be the the top of the screen there's this weird caption there like this is it say this is not a licensed device yeah but no i mean like my my thing as far as like the roku goes yeah i mean you know i, I recommend it to people as well and again i don't get paid anything either for that they really should sponsor both of us, though. I'm just saying, like, you know, again, let's get the sponsorships going. Uh, you know, then me and Robbie can spend way more time making stuff like these live streams. Uh, there's, there's your Patreon plug if you got a Patreon. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't have one, but I should probably set one up eventually. The channel's growing. Maybe I'll get to a point where enough people would yeah. would do it. Um, but re yeah. regardless... There's our news, too, yeah. Yeah. But no, regardless of that, like... You know, as far as the Roku goes, one of the reasons I recommend it, I, I'm also, by the way, for my family, a lot of them, the, the tech guy uh, and, and a lot of my non-technical friends. and You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm kind of the go-to tech guy in the circle I run in, right? And so, for a lot of people. So, and, you know, I, I'm fine to do that. Again, I think that's, you know, something I can do to help people out, you know. Uh, why not? But anyway, regardless of that, the Roku is generally what I recommend, too, because, again, it's something user-friendly. Like, my mom, for example, she's not a technical person. She even will tell you, you know, herself that, you know, she can do the basics, but she's not, you know, she doesn't want to spend 30 minutes trying to figure out how to operate a fancy computer set-top box kind of device that does way more than she'd ever need, right? All she wants is most of the time to watch, you know, something like, you know, Hulu or YouTube. So, hey, the Roku is perfect for somebody like her. She's got one on her TV that I set it for her uh, and when my, set it up actually when my father was still with us, but regardless, and they both used it because it was easy to use, right? I, I did like a five, maybe 10 minute training on, okay, you press these buttons to do, oh, you want to go to YouTube, you you know, click on this and then it opens and then you can search and, you know, oh, you want to watch something on one of the streaming services we have, well, we've got them all on here, Disney Plus, Hulu, whatever, you know, select the appropriate icon, right, you know, and search around and it, it's relatively intuitive i think for the average joe or josephine if you will to you know toss a Roku and, yeah it, it's it's intuitive enough your three-year-old can do it exactly i mean i had a roku i wasn't three when i had one but it didn't exist yet but i remember i was probably maybe 10 or 11 when i got my first roku it's been a while and like they were very like new products back then and you know even back then the software to my mind was relatively intuitive uh, you know, and I remember uh, the Twit TV network, for example. If anybody's watched that, they had a Roku app back then. And I remember I watched a lot of their stuff, so I literally would just sit there and watch it. We had cable; I almost never watched. It. I just sat there and like put up the live channel, sat back in my recliner, and just watch the the thing up on my TV full screen. So like it was a very relaxing, easy to do experience, right? And I I think honestly that's one of the compelling reasons live is so nice because you know you turn it on and it's. It's mindless entertainment, right? You don't have to sit here and be like, oh, like, I like YouTube's Q feature, for example, but with that, you have to keep queuing videos, right? Or it's going to start giving you random stuff that you may not want to watch. So with a live channel, like, you know, if you know that you like what they show, you can just throw that channel up and you're done, you know? So I, I think linear, I think a lot of people think that linear is going away. I don't think linear is going to go away. I just think it's going to move to the internet and it's going to be a supplement to video on demand where it's like, you know, yeah, you're well, bored and you're well, like, I just want to watch something NBC has today. Here's their live channel. You know, let's just see what's on. Right. Yeah. Linear is, uh, I don't think it's going away for sports. It's not going away for news. It's not going away, but maybe like for, uh, uh, stuff like that. Well, this is a live show. So like live shows would work on a linear scale, but it's also like, this is a link on YouTube, right? And he throws a notification. Hey, there's a live uh, linear show going on right now. Um, so people that follow your channel can um, will be notified. Like I saw when I went to YouTube, first thing I saw was Open Source Tonight is live. Yeah. Which is nice that you does that. Like for your 500 subscribers, if they happen to be on right now, they'll see that you're live right now and they can come and uh, uh, watch this live stream. Um, but also it's like... <laughs> Sometimes, like, I got a lot of subscribers, but sometimes, like, my live streams, um, so I got 20,000 subscribers, but on Friday, I did a live stream, and I got about 40 people. Yeah. I find with live, I get a very small percentage of the viewer base, and, I, you know, I really enjoy doing live, so it's like, I'll do it anyway, 
it doesn't really cost me anything to do this. Like right now, this is basically free, right? I'm not paying, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour to send this up to a satellite or something, you know, um, or whatever it is. I guess it might even be in the thousands. I, again, I haven't priced this, to be honest with you, uh, you know, in a while. I've seen a video you made about it, and that's kind of the last time I've seen it. It was kind of... Yeah, yeah so basically it's uh, the, the cost of, uh, you have to have the designated business line to stream the content to the uplinker. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, regardless of that, like, you know, this doesn't cost me anything. So, you know, it doesn't really have to be, you know, making me money or really, you know, I just, I'm just doing it because I like doing it, you know. But uh, that being said, uh, you know, I think that linear, you know, the live stream stuff, I think part of the problem with live has always been timing, right? Like, for example, one of the things I've noticed is the best time for me to do a live stream is Fridays at 8 o'clock. I have tried several, and that's when I get the most viewers. So I'm convinced that my audience, for whatever the reason, most of you all must be around and interested in watching something at about 8 o'clock every Friday. So that's why I'm thinking if I do a live show regularly, I think what I'm going to do is just be like every Friday, 8 Eastern. Um, you know, so that that's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, I didn't want to I didn't want to program next to you, and so that was one thing. But I thought you used to do it on Saturdays, but you've moved to Fridays, haven't you? No, I, I just happened to do it on a Friday. Oh, okay. So uh, you're although, still Saturdays normally? The, uh, yeah, Saturdays. But the numbers, the way the numbers looked, I was like, I should just do this on Fridays. Uh-oh. Because, uh, <laughs> Competition! Yeah, because happens, it takes like 12 hours for your live stream to render, and sometimes it takes 12 hours for you to see it again. So for doing a live stream, uh, Friday, then you have Saturday night, it's uh, processing and all that, and it'll be up for Saturday, and you get those extra re rewatch views. So, <laughs> I think the best time, and I'm probably everyone's gonna do Friday night bri live streams now. Th th um, thanks, but... Robbie. Now no one's gonna watch ours anymore. It's just you know, me and you. It's gonna be like five people. It's like, well, let's talk about satellites and Linux. You know? Yeah. Well, you can delete the stream after, I guess. Oh, well, if I. That, that's right. That's, that's that's right. Yeah. This is this stream is going away in 30 seconds. It's gonna self destruct. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, I'm kidding. But yeah, that seems to be uh, now. I. I am not going to be doing regular streams on Fridays. I, can't, I I'm unable to do that at this time. I just happen to be able to do that this week. Um, uh, I would I would love to be able to do that, but I probably I might be doing it the odd time, and because I don't live stream every week right now either. So, yeah, I mean, me me and you both like you know it's it's kind of I do live when I have the time. And, you know, it just depends on when I have the time. But I'm thinking, you know, Fridays is a pretty, knock on wood, a relatively open, open day, day for me to be able to do it. Yeah. yeah. And so I think Fridays at 8 o'clock, like, it's pretty rare that I have something I have to do on Fridays at 8 o'clock, you know. And so I think, it, realistically, it's probably the best time for me to do it. The audience likes it, so I think I'm going to try to do it. I, I don't know. I've, I haven't officially, like, announced it, but I'm seriously thinking about, like, saying... A, Probably in the next few days, I'll probably make up my mind and be like, yeah, I'm going to definitely do it or not. But I think what I'm probably going to do is do like a hangout live stream every week where I still going to post like videos that are recorded about stuff throughout the week and such like that. But then like the, well, the show will be like we can chat about those things and maybe I'll pick yeah. like a, a topic to talk about too. And, and by yeah. the way, just well, before we get into your course tonight. Yeah. Uh, weekly, I think that would be great for you to do it like on a, on a Friday night. Now, I wouldn't be able to catch every one of those, but uh, yeah, it's also like uh, uh, if we have other people in our group that we know that are really interested in open source software, that would probably like to, to have the live calls and all that too about yeah. uh, about open source software because that, that would probably allow for the uh, for, for that for that community. Um, it's good for tech support too because you know again. Yeah. You can have them come in and do that. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, live calls could be interesting. What what I'm thinking, I want to bring the podcast back because I haven't done it in a while and record that live to tape so people can watch us do it. And then we can – I had a suggestion from Billy a while back, my co-host on there. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could have, like, questions from the community when we do it at the end of the show? I think that would be a great idea, and I think what would be a really cool idea is we'd have the chat submit those. So it's like, you know, we start the show, the, the live show, and then at the top of the, the show we say, listen, you know, get your questions in and we'll answer, like, four or five of them probably, you know, towards the end of the program. Uh, so get them in now so that way, you know, we can – you know, kind of decide which ones we want, make sure, you know, we see it. Uh, so I think that would be a great idea. But I think the call-ins would be really good, too. I just really like the kind of, like, the hangout kind of live streams. I think they're really fun. And um, one thing that I think really is nice about just doing the live stuff is, 
for me at least, I feel like it's just it's very low effort and it's just you know it's just fun. And one yeah, thing you, that we can do is we can like pick a topic. This is something I've kind of been thinking is a good format. Is you pick a base topic. Like, again, like trying out KDE Plasma for this week. To answer somebody's question in the chat, by the way, several minutes ago, yeah, we kind of already touched on KDE a, a pretty good chunk, so if you rewind the DVR uh, feature in YouTube, you can go back and see it. We might touch on it again in a minute, but uh, that being said, like, I kind of like having that base topic, you know what I mean? Like, when I try to do a live stream where it's purely... I find with my live streams, when I have, like, say, the tagline, right, the title of the video... Uh, so for example, this is like, uh, trying out, uh, Katie Plaza. Uh, you, uh, what I did on Friday was I did a starting free satellite TV. So I gave like a 20 minute, 30 minute introduction, right? A little like monologue at the beginning, which was right on topic. And then I opened the calls and the calls, uh, could go where the wind blows. Right. And people will talk about all like from all sorts of different directions. So at least, and the way I, I see it is most people watch videos on YouTube. They watch like 10 minutes and then they drop out. So if they were to watch the replay, at least for those who watch the replay, they'll watch the first uh, 20 minutes of the video. And that's what the title says. So if I go off topic later on the video, I say in the video, we're going to go on, take calls so we can go wherever the topic may be. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so, I, I think that's a great strategy because what's then happened you can stream right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, again, we were on topic at the beginning. Pretty much every live stream on this channel I've done in the last like several weeks every single one of them it's we start out on let's talk about whatever it is and then you know by the end somebody in the chat said something i'm like well let's talk about that for 25 minutes and here we go you know we're off topic right yeah. so I, I you know i think it's part of the fun of live right it's just kind of you're along for the ride and you know the wind will take us wherever it takes us you know some people don't like it, and then there's other people that do like it so uh yeah and i'm kind of one that does like it like i'll hang out for for uh for the rest of the stream after that and other people if they, they're busy they, they, they tend to drop out that's gonna you're gonna make me want to have data on my phone so i can listen to you while i'm at work <laughs> <laughs> there you go but yeah i mean like that's the thing for me i i'm pretty comfortable like having like a, like something like this open in the background and just watching it you know it's it's one of these things where for me, I'm kind of with you. Like, as long as it's interesting to me, that's the thing. If it's off topic, but it's interesting, I'm fine. Uh, and I think our topics that we've talked about here, I think a lot of them probably are interested to the the kind of geeks, nerds, whatever y'all want to call your all selves uh, that are probably watching this feed. Right? Is you know, it's still kind of it's not on topic for the exact title of the the feed, but it is on topic in the sense that it is like we're not talking about football all of a sudden, right? Like it's still at least relatively taught technology related. You know, we're talking about oh, you remember YouTube back when it was 144p? That's technology, right? You, you know, we're, we're satellite TV. That's digital. That's technology. You know what I mean? Like so, there is. <laughs> what, what was the laugh about that for? <laughs> The, the 20, YouTube was 200p or whatever, but on my old the two core Acer laptop, that's the setting you wanted to have to be able to watch YouTube. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, like YouTube is, you know, the, the video resolutions has really come up, uh, you know, so much. I mean, and I think at this point, you know, talking about 4K, one thing that comes to mind about 4K is a lot of people don't even watch stuff in 4K. Uh, Right, they just don't have the need. Uh, so that's that's one thing that's kind of made me kind of not be too concerned about it. You know what I mean? Like because we don't really need to go over what the viewers are probably going to watch. You know, 4K and a lot of the stuff is kind of niche still, I think. And you know, like again, why not? If you could do it, and you got the bandwidth. That's the thing for me. If I had the bandwidth and a computer that can handle editing 4K a little bit quicker, because like it actually edits it's fine. It's a problem that when you render it, it takes longer. And I just, you know, it already takes longer to render HD than I'd like. So, you know, you can imagine 4K is like, oh, you know, it's the end of the world. No. And I think that, you know, I will get to a point where I'll, you know, render them in 4K. But regardless, like, I think we're still kind of an early adopter territory of a lot of this kind of stuff where it's like it exists, but not everybody has it. And even the people that have it aren't watching it. So, like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised right now if a lot of people are watching this live stream at 480p. I wouldn't be surprised, like, or even 720p. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people are happy with that. Are here. I'll see what the I'm watching on my Debian. Uh, it says HD. Yep. No, you're coming through on. Uh, I have it set to auto, and it's coming through at 1080p. Yep. Yeah, and so you know that that's the max resolution that uh, the switcher supports. So mm -hmm. there's no point in even coding higher than that because you're never going to see it. But uh, you know, yeah. Not to mention, I just again, I think 1080 is just a really good baseline, right? Like. Again, I don't think anybody's going to watch this feed and say, oh, the image is too fuzzy. 
You know, maybe, maybe in 20 years, they'll be like 1080. That's all this was. We've got 2000 K now. These people, I can't believe they ever put up with that. You know, that, that may very well happen. The aliens, you know, will be watching this in 20 years, just chilling out, you know, with their satellite internet. They're watching from the, you know what? I still and... watch, oh, it's me, but I still watch old black and white shows that are on antenna TV and on me TV, like Andy Griffith and leave it to beaver. And yeah, we're entertaining that stuff. Yeah, you know, and I mean, that's the thing, like, well, first of all, it was shot on film, they can do a high-res scan, and it can, you know, really look great in, like, 1080 anyway, but regardless of that, uh, you know, I think plenty of people are quite satisfied, I mean, I watch a lot of old stuff as well, like that, you know, like Grease Company, for example, love that show, uh, stuff like that, and those are shows that you're talking about, they were never shot in HD, um, you know, they were shot to videotape and things like that, like Grease Company, they'll never be in HD, really, without some goofy AI stuff that's gonna be probably weird to convert it, so, like, but it looks fine, you know, one of my favorite shows that's Canadian, um, is, is the Red Green Show, I, and I don't know if you've heard of it, Robbie. Uh, but it's oh, yeah. great. Of course. Yeah, it's like it's like the it's like the quintessential like Canadian show. If you ask me, it seems like every Canadian's heard of it. Uh, and I got a few yeah. friends that are Canadian that they're like, "Why do you like that show?" And I'm like, "I thought everybody in Canada liked it." And they're like, "No, almost you get everyone it in Canada." Roku device? Huh? Do you get it on your Roku device? Yeah, you can get it on YouTube. They have an official YouTube channel where all the episodes yeah, are free. YouTube, but there's a on Roku, at least the Canadian version of Roku. There is a. Um, uh, red green channel because I guess they have to have Canadian content for the Canadian version of Roku. Oh, so they okay. have red green. Oh, here comes um, my daughter with the head, the mannequin head. She fixed the mannequin head. She painted it, and it would look like it was burnt. Oh goodness! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> She's got glasses on it, <laughs> and she fixed the nose. What? Are, let, let, she fixed the nose um, because I guess I don't know. Did Peter bite it off? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Stop yelling at me, okay? Stop yelling. Okay, I'll get off the live stream. I'll I'll, I'll get off the computer and I'll uh, play with the kids. Okay, um, Vincent, I gotta go. The wife's yelling at me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. Uh, hopefully, you do this again. Uh, you, you gotta announce it. We gotta figure out where you announce these things uh, on like Facebook or something like that. I, I do it on the community tab usually, but I didn't announce this one. It was just impromptu. But yeah, we should do another one again. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for watching. Getting Robbie in trouble on Open Source tonight. See you later. <laughs> It's good chat with you. Later. Later. All right, see you later. Bye bye, folks. That was Robbie, and now there is no Robbie. It's just me. Let's look at the chat here a little bit, and I'll probably wrap this up pretty soon because we've been going on for a while. Let's see. So, uh, little King of the Kill says, uh, "Heck yeah, make a PF since fiber modem, man." Uh, still have a 15-year-old Shiba pro, uh, projector, LOL. Um, there you go. And then Sean says, I prefer Dark Guardians of Forbidden Knowledge. What is that a reference to exactly? Because I, I don't really know. Uh, is that like a TV show or something, Sean? I, I'm not aware of what that would be a... What that would be a reference to. So... I think I can probably move the camera back over to the other side too because uh, yeah now it's not the, the the sun was coming through the window earlier so we'll move the camera back and uh yeah so I'll, I'll keep both seats on the couch warm by moving around <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do but uh let's see here I guess I don't need headphones either. Let me switch my headphones off real quick. Uh, bear with me for just a second folks. There's no point wearing headphones because uh, I don't need to listen to myself talk. I can do that uh, without needing headphones. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, okay. There we are. That right there will cover it. And uh, you know what? Actually, I think this. Let's have some fun with this. Let's have some fun with this live stream, folks. You know what? I think we really, really a really good idea. Let's do a wireless tour of my studio space in just a second. Let's do that. I think that would be really cool. So bear with me here. We'll get everything all set up, and then we will be doing a live studio tour of my studio space. I think that would be pretty cool to do that. 
and uh, we're going to do this using an open source tool I'm going to talk about on the channel eventually, probably called uh, SRT. And uh, Secure Reliable Transfer is what that stands for. And it allows me to do a very low delay feed, a network feed with OBS. That's actually how you see my laptop earlier, because I didn't have a HDMI cable I could get to the laptop and everything handy. So instead of putting it into the switcher directly, I just had another computer pull it up. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to try sending a feed that way. And let's see, there it goes. All right. So let's switch over here. Let me actually let me turn on the audio on the appropriate. Okay, so it is coming in. I'm going to just bring my levels down. So this is going to be a little different experience. Okay. We're just going to do this for a split second anyway. Okay. Okay, let me turn this mic back on and I'm going to have a sync issue. For some reason, the uh, SRT is not outputting to the switcher, so let me just double check this. I bet that I need to change some settings here real quick. But yeah, this is something that I would like to do a video on in the future, actually, is this, um, this support of everything here with this SRT because it's pretty cool. Uh, Let's see, where is the sound? Hold on, it might be testing, testing, okay. I don't think, testing, 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 yeah, it's not outputting. I thought it was. Okay. Testing, 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 testing. Yeah, I don't know why it's not. Working. Is OBS muted? So I'm actually outputting this through OBS. I don't see anything. So we may want to save this for another one, but I'm going to try and get it fixed. Um, this is what the back of my camera looks like, for those that are wondering, right here. That's what the view looks like. But yeah, let me see if I can get this sorted. So I'm just going to set you all down, I guess, over here for a minute. And we will actually switch back to the camera. OK, so I'm trying to figure out why that we're not. See, we're getting sound on the SRT. We're just not getting any output for some reason. And that's the. The real question, why are we not getting any? That's a, a good one. We don't really have to do this with OBS. There's actually a way to do this with VLC as well. I think I'm going to try VLC now. And we're going to see if VLC cooperates better. So everybody just bear with me for a moment here real quick while I try that. So for those that are wondering if I actually show this right here is it. 
we can set up the SRT and let's see if it will take. Um, so you can see it now, <clears throat> I hope. But let's see. Um, all right, let's see if we can get the SRT to cooperate. <clears throat> let's see. Audio cutout. Yeah, I think that's from the thing I was already dealing with. I hope that it's sorted. Um, okay, but let's see. Yeah, it is not cooperating. So I'm going to just try reopening OBS. Maybe that's the problem. Um, folks, this is the nice thing about live is, you know, again, you are troubleshooting a lot. Uh, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind is you are troubleshooting a lot. Let's see. Okay, so if we look at the SRT. All right, testing, 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 testing. And yeah, it's not. Testing, testing. That's interesting. I don't know what its problem is. So SRT in, testing, testing. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do the, the demo here. What I was going to do was walk around and show you everything, but it doesn't want to cooperate for some reason. Why does it not want to cooperate is a great question. I don't have a great answer to go with that, but I would like to figure that out. So OBS is not outputting. Does anyone in the chat happen to know what I'm doing wrong? Because <clears throat> I mean, that's, here it is, monitoring device. I just found it. Okay, okay. Let me, okay, there we go. So now we are just outputting from OBS and uh, yeah let's go ahead and let's full screen this okay let's see what happens now we have our camera feed and if we look around we have got uh, a bunch of different things here so first of all I've got my multi-view monitor right here this is it and that shows me everything that's going on on the live feed I've got my desk over here with the big monitor you're gonna see yourself on there because that's what I'm dealing with here's the camera right and you can see right there's my microphone that you're hearing normally I actually muted it right now because the SRT it needs to be in sync with it and uh, let me see here so we'll mute the headphones over here we've got air conditioning right through here we've got a sound blanket back there that's what that big thing is and that helps knock down a lot of the noise then we've got stuff up here on our little uh you know kind of like loft area whatever you want to call it and then over here we've got that too so both those lofts are pretty much just storage and then i got like spare like stuff over here like you know, tripods, light stands, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so that's what we got. But now let me show you, I'll show you the outside. <clears throat> now, obviously, we have the couch right here. <clears throat> so if we go outside, this is what we're dealing with. Welcome to East Kentucky. This is what we're dealing with. So, and th this right here is the building uh, that's behind me, obviously. And, you know, it's an interesting place. Um, you know, like I said, it, it's a 10 by 20 foot is what it is in size. Let's we'll come on back in. And we'll just close the door. There's the, the door handle. There we go. So, I think that pretty well covers the uh, tour part of everything. Oh, there's my desktop PC right here, just in case anyone was wondering about that. Okay, so let's switch back to the other camera. And there we go. Our sound is back to the original mic as of now. 
We'll bring this a little closer and we're good to go. Oh, it's actually in the shot now. Just there, right about there. That's about as close as I can get it about it being in the shot. All right, anyway. So uh, what do y'all think about that? Any any thoughts about that? Anything interesting? Any questions about that? I figured I'd just kind of do that while we were on the air. Seemed like a fun idea. A lot of these live streams is just that, fun ideas where I just, uh, you know, do the fun idea. So, yeah, any any thoughts on that? I don't know. Uh, anyway, but, yeah, I think that uh, today's show went really good. I want to do this again, and I think that that's going to prove to be a good idea. So, yeah, folks, I tell you, I think that pretty well covers everything today. I mean, there's really nothing else that comes to mind, so I think we'll go ahead and end the show here at about 3 minutes and 40 seconds, uh, you know, but I think it's pretty good. And Robbie said, cool to see you outside. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Um you know, so we might do that some more with the SRT. I think one thing that would be really interesting with the SRT stuff is actually, um, I think one thing that would be really interesting with the SRT is I've got an ATEM Mini, the older switcher, I, I can plug into my laptop and then I could feed that through OBS over SRT. So I could like have a different part of the property where I could do a remote feed up to the studio. So maybe like a do some kind of thing on the property or something where I like show like, for example, one idea I had is I could show you all uh, the cable run from the basement up here for my um, system, um, for my uh, system for internet. So if you look over, hold on, I think we should probably get the camera feedback up real quick, and then we'll pick up from there from my laptop. So if we look right through there I don't know if y'all can see that or not I'm trying to get it to where the light isn't in the way that white box on the wall there there's a lens flare so it's kind of hard to see but that box that box what that is is that is actually a mocha box and it actually takes the internet up here and converts it to mocha and the, the computer network and then I can turn around and hook that into a switch as I've done under my desk and then I've got it you know, working access up here to everything. So that could be an interesting idea for a live stream is I could show something like that uh, over the Wi-Fi. Assuming the SRT works, the, the testing I don't have SRT over Wi-Fi it seems to actually be pretty reliable. The thing about it is it's, it reminds me kind of like a like satellite contribution on like TV where it's like there's a delay, right, of about maybe a second or, or so generally. That's not really too bad uh, for a lot of things, but, you know, depending on what it is, it could be interesting. Watching on the projector as I clean up Legos. I got you. Well, I'm glad you're watching, Robbie. <clears throat> okay. But, yeah, um, I'm trying to think if there's really anything else that would make sense to touch on here on... Uh, on the show before we end it, because I mean, at this point we're kind of getting really long in the tooth, and I probably overstayed my welcome. Um, okay, I'll tell you one thing we can we can actually talk a little bit about maybe, and that would be um, that would probably be. Let's see here, we could talk about. Uh, hold on, we're talking about that MPEG dash thing I was talking about for a minute here. Let's talk about that. So that might be something like considering somebody like Robbie and other people considering we've talked so much about video stuff. That's kind of types of probably interested. In. Um, so there's a great article here from Cloudflare that I will put up on the screen in just a few seconds. And actually, I'll put it in the chat too, real quick first. So anybody that wants to follow along with me, but it, this is actually related to. Um, the streaming stuff I was talking about. So there is a open standard called MPEG dash. And if we actually take a look at talking about it, hold on just a second. Let me get a, get a uh, feed of the website up. Okay. There we go. So here it is. This right here, uh, so what is MPEG dash? So it is a delivery mechanism and it uses HTTP and what it basically allows us to do is to deliver programming 
uh, over a CDN, and this works on most systems. Um, but one of the things that's really nice about it that I like is this part right here, encoding formats. MPEG dash allows the use of any encoding standard. HLS, on the other hand, requires the use of H.264 or 5. And so one thing that's nice from a licensing standpoint is VP9 is open source. It's royalty free. There's really nothing that would prevent you, if you wanted to, from building a streaming service with it. And streamers like Netflix actually use it when available. If you actually do, Netflix has got this stats of nerd screen where it's like you could do Control, Alt, Shift, D, if memory serves as the shortcut, all at the exact same time. On a desktop browser session only, you can get this, and it will show you what codec it's using, and often it's VP9. It also shows you the frame rate of the content and about a million other things, so if you're interested you could do that um the problem with hls support is it doesn't or not hls but but with non-hls support is the fact that some systems require hls so macbooks here they're a little technically inaccurate because if you don't use safari like we can play mpeg dash i've done it here on my mac for example in firefox and chrome and i can use mpeg dash not only page 264 and make that work but it also can use vp9 and VP8 and such like that. So you can have some interesting options. Um, so that's kind of something that I'm thinking about with my streaming stuff that I've been working on is if we could build that out, that would be really good. So also, while we're talking about the camera earlier, if we switch back to my desktop, this is the camera I was talking about that I have. It's a nice camera. Again, it shoots 6K resolution. So max resolution of the sensor is uh, that you can run it at is 6,144 by 30 uh, by 3,456 pixels. Super 35 sensor, and I don't know what that. There we go. That was weird. Um, it's got dual native ISO, you know, EF mount, all that good stuff. I think it's pretty cool. And for those that are wondering, this is the switching software you might be seeing because I'm switching from the computer that I'm actually using. I got the control panel over here where the cables are. Otherwise, I could switch with the control panel. Let's check the chat here real quick. Let's see what's going on on the chat. All right. <clears throat> Interesting. So I, I do see that the chat is probably calming down. So, yeah, I think we're probably going to, like I said, end this here. For one thing, I want to end this stream before the four-hour mark because on YouTube, if you didn't know, at the four-hour mark, it stops uh, the recording and we won't have a, a recording of the show on YouTube. It's, like, pre-generated at uh, the four-hour mark. Trevor said, you're fired! You're fired! You're fired! Um, that's a quote from a movie right there, actually, that I watched when I was a kid. Anyway, but, yeah, um... Another reason I should probably end the show, too, is my laptop's battery's about to die, and I need to go charge it. I don't have the charger up here. so. But anyway, folks, I thank you very much for watching Open Source tonight. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I know I enjoyed it. That was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. Um, I'll give everybody a, a, the last few seconds here if they want to type anything in the chat real quick. Ask me anything. I'll, I'll end this show here in the next two or three minutes. And, yeah, we'll go from there. But this is the time to... Uh, go ahead and take a look if there is anything you want me to ask. I'll go back up through the chat and make sure I didn't miss anything here. Uh, let's see here. Haven't used Windows since 95, man. Uh, little uh, King of the Hill, or the Kill says. Trying to figure out Windows 11 for my daughter is now a nightmare. Yeah, uh, you know, Windows can be interesting, can it? I found out my old Atari 600XL is in the attic in a box just yesterday. So, you know, that's, it. you know, there's some pretty interesting stuff on that. Um, I still have every SUSE Linux from Best Buy in the box from version 8.2 to 10.1. Interesting. Also, Mandaric, uh, Mandaric, whatever, I can never pronounce that Linux distro name right. Sorry. Love KDE, got it on my Pinebook Pro. Oh, interesting. So you got a Pinebook. Okay. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, I, I've thought about getting you, like, maybe one day, like, one of the pine books or something. Like, it's just pretty cool. Um, what I think would be really cool is if somebody made an ARM laptop like this, but was designed to run Linux and do it really well, I think, because I, I really like the ARM architecture. I mean, this thing lasts forever on a charge, right? I mean, it's literally, it's not been on the charger for probably six hours now, maybe seven hours. And it's still got, let's see, 14% remaining. 
and that's pretty good. So, yeah, there you go. What is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? You didn't specify what type of question, Sean says. I walked into that one, didn't I? You're right, I did not specify. Um, I'm not really capable of answering that question, unfortunately, I don't think. But uh, thanks for the question, Sean, anyway. I wish there was a true open source phone. That would be interesting. You know, part of the problem I see with an open source phone, and you know, is the software, right? Because like we, we, you know, you can put Linux on a phone. Like people have done that, right? Like the Pine phone exists that you can do stuff like that. The problem I see with it is, is that software support's not there. I mean, like desktop Linux, we've got better software support than mobile Linux, from what I can tell. Like you know, so. You know, like, we're not going to have an Instagram or something like that. And some people will say, well, I don't care about those things anyway. Well, if we want to really get a lot of market share, I think plenty of people are going to care if there's an U- official YouTube app, an official Facebook app, etc. So I think that's really the biggest issue with that. At the end of the day, though, I have to admit, I think it would be an interesting idea. One thing I like about the idea of a Linux phone is the fact that it could be like Android where you could sideload your own apps because, I mean, it's a Linux phone. I'm pretty sure it's going to be wide open as far as, like, you know, if you want to put your own apps on it, I don't think there's... If there is a way that's, like, protected from you being able to do it, I'm sure there's going to be, like, some setting you can change or something kind of like an Android. I would hope so. And that, I think, would be really interesting. But, yeah, I don't know. I I, I would love to see a Linux phone. I think it would be really cool. But I don't know when it's going to be ready for complete prime time. I hope it is. And, you know, like I said, hold my breath on it. Uh, Let's see here. Just looking at the chat again here real quick. Yeah, so we got 10 minutes until I have to end the stream. So I'm going to try and end it about a minute early. So we got about nine minutes from now, eight minutes from now until I have to end the stream. But yeah, I mean, I think that a Linux phone would be an interesting concept. I do. Um, I got to say, full disclosure, I've never actually owned a Linux phone, though. I'm just not much of a mobile phone user at all. I, I This is what I consider mobile to me. This is what I want is a laptop, right? Um, I guess that's the programmer me or whatever. I just never really cared much for, for smartphones. They're great in certain situations, but I don't travel much. Like, I think if I travel a lot more, I would definitely want to, to have a smartphone um, again because I haven't really used one, like, on a daily basis in a, two or three years, I guess. A little bit before the pandemic I hit, I kind of got out of that. But, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's an interesting idea. Ah, it's an interesting idea. So I don't know, has any of you all, uh, I guess I'll put the question to you, and has any of you used an open source uh, operating system for a phone like a a Linux distribution or something else that's custom or whatever? I I would be interested to see if anybody had any comments on that, and if so, what was the experience like? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Let me know. So that's something that I think would be an interesting question. Um, you know, I mean, I will say this. There is Linux for this MacBook Air that you can get, like, that will run on ARM and, like, it's designed, like, they've built, like, the drivers for it and stuff. It's called, like, a, a Sari, a Sassy, a Sassy. I don't know how do you pronounce it, Linux. So that would be interesting. If you had a choice between Ubuntu 704 and Windows Vista, which one would you choose? You know, as far as, like, Linux versus Windows... Back in that day, I didn't use Linux back then, but it seemed to me like that Windows really, like these days, I don't really miss Windows as much if I'm using Linux. But I mean, you do miss certain things like certain programs you want that you might not be able to get on Linux or something. But like to me, back in those days, I think there would have really been a bigger divide, at least from what I can tell looking back. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so I think I would have probably wanted to been on Vista. Um, it also probably helps that I know Vista uh, because I used Windows Vista for a while back then. And so at least I would be familiar with it. Um, right. And I mean, I, I'm not familiar with Ubuntu 704 really at all. Right. I know pretty much nothing about it. So Vista, at least I knew how it worked and such, and I could get it to, to do what I needed. So, you know, that's an important thing when you got a computer, you know, it needs to, needs to be able to do the job for whatever it is that you do. So thanks for the questions, everybody. But yeah, I think we pretty well covered our show. Uh, You know, my laptop is at 13%, so I think it's time to end the show. 
I do. But everybody, thank you very much for watching Open Source tonight. Really do appreciate your viewership. I hope to see you all again very soon. Uh, I think I am going to do the live stream thing, by the way, as a programming note, uh, starting every Friday at 8 o'clock. It may not be every Friday, but at least most Fridays. And so follow the community tab of this channel closely. I will post announcements there. I generally do. The only time I don't really is if I haven't scheduled something really in advance. And that does happen. Like this stream was really just had the time. Decided to do it, you know, so that one doesn't really count, but a lot of them. Uh, oh, time zone wise, that will be 8 p.m., Sean. Good question on that. Ti that time zone wise, I always list it in UTC and then Eastern time. So that's 8 p.m. Eastern time. I forget what it is in UTC. Let me convert it for you all real quick, and I'll tell you. 8 p.m. EST to UTC is, is uh, that is 1 a.m. UTC. So that is, you know, if you don't use the 1 a.m., that would be 100 UTC slash 8 p.m. EST uh, every Friday is what I'm thinking as far as time zone would go in the future. Well, anyway, folks, I think that really covers our show uh, quite well. I know I've enjoyed the show. I hope you have too. And without further ado, let's fade to black. Goodbye, everybody.